So in case you guys missed it, I bought my dream shop over the summer, which is super exciting. But there's also a ton of work to be done to get this place renovated. So the first thing I tackled after filming the shop tour video was having the old ratty insulation removed. And this building was a cabinet shop for many years prior to me purchasing it, and evidently the dust generated by the shop worked its way into every nook and cranny of the insulation. After the insulation was removed, there was a solid quarter to half inch layer of dust on every surface in the shop, and I had my work cut out for me cleaning everything up. I spent a few hours here with a shop vac getting up the bulk of the material, and my buddy Seth from Burn Peak also let me borrow his Makita robotic vacuum to help continue the cleanup process. The next step in the cleanup process was getting rid of all the junk the previous owner had left behind, including this very questionable wall in the middle of the spray booth. And I'm pretty sure there was a very specific horticultural purpose for building this wall, if you catch my drift, but I wanted the space back so I demoed the wall and got rid of the materials. Continuing the demolition process, I jumped over to the addition, the leftmost kind of hallway looking section of my new shop, and demoed the sagging particle board shelving and plywood platform the shelving was sitting on. I ran a line of 2x4s perpendicular to the ceiling joists so I could attach the lights anywhere along the line and then came back and installed the fixtures. Also my buddy Alex from the single track sampler was staying at the shop at this point and having a second set of hands during this process was super helpful. After getting everything wired up I could turn the power back on to the lights and thankfully they fired right up. First shot. Once that was done, I got the old fluorescent lights removed and also cleaned out the cavities between the joists while I was at it since they were pretty nasty. With the lighting handled, I got prepped to paint this big wall in this hallway by vacuuming up the floor and the walls themselves. I was able to get a coat on this roughly 500 square foot wall in less than 15 minutes, which is just insane. So as you might have noticed, I stopped short when painting this wall, and that's because I knew I wanted to come back and waterproof this back section, where some water had gotten in a few months back during some rather torrential rains here in Asheville. And luckily there's been no water getting in since then, but I figured applying a few coats of dry lock, a waterproofing paint, definitely wouldn't hurt, so I had Nate get that knocked out. I was also seeing some water coming in on the other side of the shop, and this was a little bit more concerning to me since I knew I'd be covering up these walls with framing and plywood. So I wanted to get the problem areas back to the bare concrete block first before waterproofing, and I thought it was going to take a heck of a lot of work to remove the paint. But instead, as you can see, the paint chipped off in really big sections without too much effort, especially once I switched over to an SDS drill with a tile scraping bit. So Nate got to work stripping the rest of the paint, making sure to wear a respirator in case there was lead paint on this wall and to prevent breathing the mold spores. Over the next few days, we had a good bit of rain here in Asheville, and now that the dry lock was removed, we could see just how much water was trying to work its way through the block, and this confirmed that all of this waterproofing work would be worth the effort. Once we were satisfied with the paint removal, we could finally get started waterproofing, starting by using this concrete etch and cleaner. This etch is applied with a stiff brush and then rinsed with water to neutralize the acid in the etch. Once the concrete was etched, we could come back and patch any problem areas with hydraulic cement, and Nate started by adding hydraulic cement along the joint where the concrete block met up with the slab, as this area was where a lot of the water was working its way through. He also filled any big cracks in the block as these are areas where air and moisture could easily penetrate through the walls. And Nate went through the entire 10 pound bucket of this hydraulic cement fixing the block and once that was done he could finally get the dry lock applied. And you want a super consistent film of dry lock to have the most effective waterproofing. Nate then repeated the process for a second and third coat, repeating the process of rolling on the dry lock and then filling any pinholes with the brush, and the entire five gallon bucket of dry lock was used up on these walls. Now I should mention that waterproofing the inside of these walls is really just phase one, as the most effective way to deal with this kind of water intrusion is on the outside of the walls. Now, I've already cleaned off the roof and gotten the gutters working better, which helped move water away from the building. And the next step will be barring excavator to do some dirt work around the building. All right, guys, so today is a big day here at the new shop. Today, the guys from the Perkins Builder Brothers channel, they helped me frame the not-so-tiny house you guys might remember. They are coming out. If you guys watch the shop tour, you'll remember 
this weird kind of mezzanine situation that one of the previous owners had built out. And after talking to a structural engineer, that really weakened this concrete wall because those joists help to brace the top of that wall. So we're gonna drop this whole ceiling back down, which is gonna be a lot of work. Hopefully kind of get back to just a empty area back here so that I can do the building work that we need to do coming up. The Birkins crew started rolling in a few minutes later, and once Eric rolled in, we got right to work clearing out the mezzanine and attic area so we could start the demo work. And as you can probably see, this was some insanely dusty work. And this building was a cabinet shop at one point in its life and the amount of dust packed into every nook and cranny in here is just insane. So once the two areas were cleared out we got to work pulling the plywood off of this area in the attic and the goal was to reuse as much of this material as possible considering the insane cost of building materials currently. Unfortunately, the pieces around the perimeter of this area were sandwiched between the wall framing above and floor joists below, so we had to run a circular saw around the area to cut the boards free, but once that was done, the demo really started moving along. And it never ceases to amaze me how quickly work gets done with a full crew of people who know what they're doing, like the Perkins crew. Next, we needed to relocate the support posts that connected the girders, which support the roof trusses, to the steel I-beam in the lower level of the building. And these posts had been bearing on this existing floor structure, so we needed to add new, longer posts before removing the floor. Jamie started by hacking out an opening in the floor so the new post could span the distance between the girder and the I-beam, and then we went digging for material for the new posts. And after scrounging through the wood pile left by the previous owner, we found these triple ply oak posts which were perfect for this application. Once that was done, we could get the first post cut to fit, and you might notice that we also set up a line laser to see if this girder had sagged at all over the years, which it had. And to remedy this, we cut our new post a little longer so the girder would end up straighter after the old posts and temporary supports were removed. And as you can see, as we tapped our temporary support out of the way, the girder dropped down onto the new post, and then we could get the post attached to the girder with a few screws. After siding the girder along the length of the building, we also noticed it was bowed out in this area as well. So Eric grabbed sledge and knocked it back into place, and this also got our new post plumbed up very nicely. We repeated the same process to install the other post and then got the rest of the plywood removed, grabbing a couple of cool slow-mo dust shots for good measure along the way. Once all the plywood was removed, we needed to get the wall framing dealt with. And basically we had two wall sections here, and we needed to span these two sections with some kind of framing to tie them together. The solution the Perkins brothers came up with was to add an inner piece spanning the two existing rim joists, which would bring the material flush with the studs in the upper wall section, and then we could tie the two sections together with one long stud. Also, as we finished the wall framing, we could go ahead and start taking down the joists since the walls were now braced. And luckily this was a pretty simple process with this beast of a craftsman pry bar, and we just slid the joists out of our way temporarily as we went. Also, in addition to the crazy dust, we had quite a few cobwebs to deal with, and I'm glad Jamie was working up there instead of me. Uh, if you should. I don't know if you should. Yeah, you got a little dangler. Once we got a handful of the joists removed, we could start getting them reinstalled back at their original height, and Eric crowned the boards as we went with the crown facing up. As far as layout, we didn't really have much of one, as we were mainly referencing off of the existing joists, which we were butting these joists up against. And our main goal was to get the joists straight and keep the spacing consistent, and this ended up working out fine. We also went ahead and removed the plywood from the mezzanine as we went, as this was much easier than trying to do it after all the joists were dropped down and in our way. And from there, we really got into a rhythm and the joists started moving super quick. Wow, money. Yeah, since Johnny didn't bring a second camera today, there's no shots of this lower mezzanine getting taken down by Jason and Ray. And we don't even know how they did it. There's no video footage, but it happened and it's done. I don't think it happened. Oh, it's done. If you don't it's get gone. video of it, did it really happen? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go for it. Here she goes. Nice. 
four tough. Out, you know, what I do know is that the two of us are on this really skinny scaffolding like this far apart. Uh-huh, it's true. And um, I didn't have onions for lunch. <laughs> Neither did I. We wrapped up day one by getting the last of the joists removed, and then I could take a step back to admire our work. And I honestly can't believe we got all of this done in one day. And I was super excited to see what we could knock out on day two. Another one of the many things we found here when we removed this floor system is that the floor system was stabilizing this post that's holding the roof up. And you can see now that we've removed the floor. This whole wall is hinging right here. And that's because it's not balloon framed. So we're gonna basically stabilize this with a big stiffener to make it to where it doesn't flex because there's big doors right here too. Oh yeah, that's good and solid right there. No flex. To help with this, we added another vertical piece of framing which spanned across where the previous floor had been located. And this helped in this spot, but then we discovered yet another area of flex in the building. Wow. That's no big deal. Yeah, it's good for airflow. Anyway, back to the floor, the first thing we did was add a few layout boards which locked the joists into place, and this allowed us to get these joists straightened using our trusty laser eye prior to installing the plywood. Johnny's given this the laser eye, because these aren't in any kind of layout, they're just whatever was here, that's what we did. So we're, we can't just lay out our board, because we don't know what it is. Towards you. Curve. Oh yeah, that's big curve. I mean, it's got all the curves. We also went ahead and added that last missing floor joist and we had to scab together two shorter floor joists for this as I couldn't find these 20 foot long 2x12s locally. Now that all the joists were in, we could start the process of getting the plywood decking reinstalled and we started by snapping a reference line for the sheets. Oh, it hit me, I, I looked straight into the light. The sun was in my eyes. <laughs> all right, we're gonna get the sheet back in. The panels on this first row needed to be notched around the posts we'd installed previously, and we got our cut station set up using some foam board as our cutting surface. I want to know who set up the cut station directly above my coffee, because I just got dusted. That's good fiber. <laughs> this is like free fiber. It's still Ooh, it's not bad. There I'm going to go. drink it anyway. Yeah, man. We added some Advantech subfloor adhesive to help this plywood stick permanently to these joists, and we attached the panels with 2 and 3 eighths of an inch ring shank framing nails. And the installation was a little slow going, as it was basically a scavenger hunt trying to find a piece the right length to fit the span we needed so that we could save on material. Eventually though, we got to the last piece and the sheathing was done. Next on the list, since we were already working up here in the attic, was getting these trap doors removed and framed back in. As you might remember, the previous owner used these doors as attic access, but they're super dangerous, and I want to insulate this entire floor anyway, so these needed to go. And of course, the hinges on the doors were installed with an absolutely insane number of nails, so they were a little difficult to remove, but eventually we got the first door off. Yeah! Wow! And Eric and Jamie worked on breaking the first door down into more manageable chunks, while I got the second door open, and then we got the second door removed and cut up before the real fun, dropping the door pieces down to the first floor. Yeah, can you move that light? Yeah, that light was gonna be toast. <laughs> the car, kid. What? The car. I can't hear you. The car, kid. There it is. Also, did I mention that it was dusty in there? Next, we removed any other extra framing bits and then we could get joists added back to this giant hole in the floor. And these were the floor joists we removed from the mezzanine, so more reclaimed material was able to be used here as well. Also, I'll be going back and adding joist hangers here since these joists aren't bearing on the block wall or I-beam like the other joists. Finally, we could scrounge together the last pieces of the three quarter inch plywood to deck this area. And with that, we could call this part of the shop series a wrap. This is a nice piece here. <laughs> I might actually take that home and use it. You know, it's already got the hangers uh -huh. on it. What do you think that does for the structural? I mean, I think it's double as strong as it is. <laughs>
strong as it was, I'll tell you that much. It's at least twice as much. Good, good airflow, you know? Yeah, I mean, it won't ever rot. I mean, I'm gonna check the mask, but I think it's twice as good. <laughs> All right, guys, so the next task on the to-do list is gonna be to get rid of these windows. And I know you guys might think I'm crazy basically boarding up the windows here in the shop, but these windows are garbage. Um, this panel is glass right here, but this one is just a piece of plexiglass, which I guess is why they put these bars up here. Uh, but this is definitely not a super secure setup. So as soon as the Perkins guys arrived, the windows were promptly demoed and removed. Oh, there you go. Oh. Boom. That was close. <laughs> And since these walls are concrete block, we used treated material here to avoid any moisture damage and fasten the plates to the walls with concrete anchors. While Ray and Jason wrapped up the first window, I moved on to the next window in line and started getting the bottom of the window opening cleaned up. On the outside of the shop, Jason and Jono worked on getting the windows sheathed with that leftover Zip R material. And considering that these window openings were exactly four feet by five feet, they were super simple to sheathe with a single piece of Zip R. The last thing to do was get some siding on the sheathing, and we used the fiber cement panels from the metalworking area in the old shop here, as they match the block exterior fairly well. And cutting these panels is a super dusty job, and this concrete saw made really quick work of the task. We used a siding nailer to attach the panels, and I'll probably come back and add some kind of trim just to dress up these openings a bit later. The other big thing that needed to be removed was the natural gas heater and the gas line running to the heater, which was directly in the way of where we needed to frame the walls. So we had an HVAC company come shut off the gas, and then we broke down the gas line into more manageable chunks with this little porta band. Finally, the HVAC technician capped off the line to close the opening in the line, and then he got the gas turned back on and checked for leaks, which there weren't any. Once the gas line was dealt with, we cut the heater free of the threaded rod it was hanging from and then dropped it onto some scaffolding to keep it mobile. And I'll be installing mini splits in this space in the future, which are both much quieter and take up a lot less space than this monstrous heater, but it was definitely a bit of a bummer to lose our only heat source here in the shop. With the heater out of the way, Eric and I took a quick detour around the back of the building because with the heater now officially out of commission, it meant we could get rid of the giant vent pipe for the heater, which was blocking the doors leading into the attic. And after removing the pipe, we headed up to the attic to get the doors opened up, and this was a little easier said than done. So evidently the previous owner knew that they wouldn't be using the doors since the vent pipe was in the way, so they consequently nailed the doors shut. This was nothing a little sledgehammer work couldn't fix, however, and in no time we had the door open. And after removing one last pesky nail, the door was operational again. Heck yeah! <laughs> yeah. Maybe you can get another log for a ramp too. Yeah. Go ahead yeah. and <laughs> get well, I was planning to build a little platform out here, you know, like a little deck type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, then, and you'd uh, have good access down there. Yeah. That's going to make this upstairs way more usable. I can back a truck up. We got back on track and went ahead and plugged the hole in the side of the building left by the vent pipe with a little rigid foam and sealant. And then it was time to get to framing. We got started by getting our top and bottom plates set in place, but this was a little tricky due to the severe bow in the middle of these walls. And we wanted the studs to be in contact with the wall in the center, as the support created by these walls was kind of the entire point of building them, and Eric came up with a simple but very effective technique for marking the locations of the plates. So first he took a straight 2x6 and held it tight to the center of the wall and plumbed the board with a level. Next, we can mark where the board intersected the joists in the floor above and at the slab. We then repeated this process every four or five feet, and then once we had enough marks, we came back and connected the marks with a chalk line, and this was our layout line for the bottom and top plates. You know, you go. No, no you got it. You go. <laughs> we attached the bottom plate to the slab with a few concrete anchors, and these were just to hold the plate in place while we worked as I needed to come back and connect the plates to the slab with three quarter inch anchor bolts as specified by the structural engineer who came up with this whole plan. We got the top plate attached to the floor joist above with three and a quarter inch long 16 penny galvanized nails. 
Once the plates were in, we could start cutting the studs to fit and installing them, toenailing them to the plates. And we had to frame these walls in place like this as the walls would have been impossible to stand up if we built them on the ground. Also, the slab level kind of ebbs and flows and we could account for that by framing the walls in place. To further add to the strength of these walls, the engineer also specced joist hangers at the top and bottom of each stud, and thankfully I was able to pick up a pair of metal connector nailers prior to this as we had roughly 180 joist hangers to install on these walls. And having two guns ended up working out great as we could keep one gun loaded with inch and a half long joist hanger nails for the straight connections, and then keep the other gun loaded with two and a half inch long nails for the diagonal connections. And from there, it was really just rinse and repeat until we got to the first diagonal wall brace, which we decided to just go ahead and remove since it was sitting there loose, clearly not under any load. I'm Johnny Brook, welcome to Jack. <laughs> It's not Jack, it's unless the wall falls on you, man. It won't do anything. We needed to plane down the back edge of the bottom plates towards the end of this wall due to some excess mortar buildup at the bottom of the block, and I thought it'd be good to get some sweet slow-mo shots of the planing action. Oh, that was nice. Yeah, I got it, I got it. And hopefully that shot was worth getting covered in sawdust for, and let me know in the comments if it was. Did you get it that time? I'm out. Yeah, I got it. Anyway, we wrapped things up for day one shortly after, and I think we made really good progress on this first day. And it was crazy looking at the studs up against these bowed block walls. It was almost like an optical illusion, because it made the studs look insanely crooked, when in reality it was just the wall that was crooked. Also, Eric's technique of setting the plate location seemed to work perfectly, as you can see that pretty much every stud contacts the wall in the middle. Back for day two, the guys got to work wrapping up the framing on the right wall, and it was a little tricky working around that natural gas line, but they got it done. And while they worked, Eric and I got the vapor retarder laid out for the back wall. Yeah, it's not light. <laughs> Why is it so heavy? Yeah, it's totally <laughs> dense. So we attached the Stego vapor retarder to the wall with this Stego tag tape, and we went ahead and ran three rows of the tape before hanging the vapor retarder. And you might be asking why I'm even using this vapor retarder here, and it's really just an extra layer of protection, as this should help to keep excess moisture from building up behind this back wall, which is completely subgrade. With the vapor retarder installed, we could get to framing the back wall, which was really just more of the same, except we needed to add some blocking where the top plates landed between the floor joists above. And while the guys wrapped up framing the rest of the wall, I came back and added blocking where the walls for the CNC room would meet up with the exterior walls, and rather than going with the typical kind of stud pocket that I would have used in the past here, I instead used this ladder blocking style, which saves a ton on materials versus a stud pocket. And I could use up lots of short offcuts for this ladder blocking, and the only real difference will be when I go to add the plywood wall sheathing, as I'll just need to pay more attention to where this blocking is during the installation. The guys got the rest of the back wall wrapped up, and with that, we could call the exterior wall framing done. While Jason got the bottom plate installed, Eric started measuring for blocking, which needed to be installed since the top plate was gonna land between two floor joists. And we were able to use up a lot of material that we had demoed in the attic space for this blocking, and I loved not having to send all this material to the landfill, especially considering the cost of materials right now. We snapped a line for the second bottom plate and got that installed while Eric and Ray started laying out the door opening on the other wall. For the door opening here, I ended up going with roughly 7 feet wide and just under 8 feet tall. And this should allow me to easily get full sheets of plywood loaded onto the CNC, and the doors will open inward and swing completely out of the way against the wall. And I'll be building these doors so I can add soundproofing insulation to them to help keep the noise from the CNC isolated in this room. And also in case you're wondering, the dimensions of the room are 12 feet wide by 15 feet deep. Once the front wall was framed, we repeated the process to frame the side wall, and all of this framing material was pulled out of my old shop. So with that, the CNC room was framed, so we could move on to building the platform. And we needed to frame the CNC room first, as the platform would span the area between the spray room and the CNC room. 
To get started, we set up a line laser at three and a half inches off the ground, and this represented the top edge of the platform framing. And we got this first board lined up with the laser and nailed it to the wall, and then we could move on to the second board in line. We then repeated the process of installing the band boards along the back wall, and as you can see, these boards were about an inch off the ground along this wall, which just goes to show how sloped this slab was in places. We got the boards attached to the outside of the spray room with concrete anchors, and then we could get the rim joists installed on the front edge of the platform. We snapped a line for these joists, and as you can see, these boards were going to run across the frame straightener, so they needed to be notched to fit. And Ray knocked this out with a circular saw, and then we could attach the front band board. We were able to use the spots where we needed to scab two boards together to our advantage here, as we could offset the blocking downwards to bring the band board up to our laser line, and this ended up working out great for leveling this front band board. The very last board needed to be trimmed a little bit as the slab was higher right in front of this door opening, but after trimming that piece, we got it installed and wrapped up the perimeter of the platform. So I used treated 2x4s and couldn't find them in long enough lengths for this 20 foot deep platform, so we had to scab two boards together to get our joists. Once the boards were connected in the middle, we could get them attached to the rim joists at either end, toenailing them at the back wall and screwing through the face of the rim joist at the front. Once we had a few joists set in place, we could start getting them level by lining them up with the line laser. And to keep the joist at the correct height, we nailed on a pressure treated foot, which both set the height and supported the joist. And we let these feet run long and cut them off with a reciprocating saw, which was much faster than trying to cut and match the angle of the floor. Now obviously the span from those center feet to the edges of the platform were much more than seven and a half feet, and to support the joists along their length, we just continued adding more feet, adding a row towards the front edge of the platform to support that connection between the rim joist and the floor joist, and then another row between those first two rows. We added another two rows towards the back half of the platform, and the span was easily less than five feet in any given spot, which made this platform pretty much rock solid. To prepare for adding the sheathing, Eric and I got a layout board attached to the joists, and this locked the boards on layout here in the middle of the platform where the joists could shift left and right. From there, we got the last few joists set and then went around and added a bunch more feet using up most of the scraps we had generated. And we also wised up and started cutting the feet flush with a circular saw, which was much easier than a reciprocating saw. All in all, I think this technique, while maybe unconventional, ended up working out great and really simplified the process of building this platform over this sloped floor. So with that, the framing was done, so next we snapped a line four feet in from the front edge of the platform. To attach the Advantech to the joists, we used two and three eighths of an inch galvanized ring shank nails, and between the ring shank nails and the subfloor adhesive, I don't expect to ever have any squeaks in this floor. One other really nice thing about Advantech are all of the layout marks that are printed directly on the boards. And this makes fastening super simple as you don't even have to think about your nail pattern. We had to cut the left end piece on this second row to fit and the track saw is really the best way to cut this kind of material. It leaves a super clean cut edge and cuts really quickly through this very dense material. One other thing you can see Jason doing on this last piece is shifting the joists to match layout before I attach them to the Avantec. And this again helps to lock the joists in their correct layout. The piece for the right end of this row was the same story and we got it cut to fit and then nailed it in place, which completed our first row. From there, we got in a really good rhythm as we could just add another row referencing off of the previous row. And we made sure to tap the new piece along its edge to lock the groove into the tongue on the previous row, and this further helps to stiffen the floor. It's also a good idea to use a board between your sledge and the edge of the subfloor to keep from damaging the tongue. The last row was a bit of a snug fit, but I was able to use a pry bar to lock the tongue and groove together since there was really no way to get a sledge in there. With that, we achieved everything save for the first row, and that's where we called it for day one. We started day two by working on a ramp for the platform, and that's why we left that first row of sheathing off so we could attach the wedge-shaped framing pieces for the ramp to the rim joist more easily. And I wanted to add a ramp to the front of this platform for a few reasons. First, I use carts and dollies a ton for moving around materials, and this ramp will allow me to wheel those onto this platform. Second, I'm planning to host woodworking classes in this shop in the future, and I want the shop to be accessible so handicapped folks are able to attend my classes. 
I started by marking a 16 inch on center layout for the ramp supports and I offset the layout from the joists to make them easier to install. To cut the ramp supports, we first cut four foot lengths of treated material and then ripped them diagonally from one corner of the board to the opposite corner. And by making the cuts this way, we got two ramp supports out of each piece and considering how humpy this floor is, they were plenty accurate enough. We attached the supports to the rim joist using a few 3 inch screws and as you'll see the floor certainly was not flat in this area. And we decided the easiest way to deal with this was just to attach the end of the ramp to the slab using some concrete anchors which pulled the ramp supports tight to the floor. The last thing we did was add a few support blocks to help keep the front edge of the platform from flexing up when we attached the ramp supports to the slab later and this just helped to lock everything in place. Once that was done, we could sheathe the last row on the main platform, which went super fast, and then we could sheathe the ramp. First, we tested how the transition between the panels would end up, and as it turns out, the tongue and groove still seated fine with the panel angled like this and had a super smooth transition. I decided to forego the subfloor adhesive and use screws on these ramp panels just in case I ever need to change things up here in the future. As I mentioned, I attached the bottom edge of the platform to the slab using concrete anchors, and this really locked everything in place, although I ran out of anchors and was only able to install them roughly every three feet at this point. All right, woo! Clear it off, time to christen it. Once that was done, the platform and ramp were officially built, and to christen them, as is now tradition after building the tiny house, I pulled out the hoverboard and cruised around on this super smooth floor. And I don't know if there's a more efficient way to clean an area than riding a hoverboard with a leaf blower. Of course, the guys had to give the hoverboard a go, and Eric was a pretty solid rider, but Ray's skills still haven't improved since the tiny house build. So we called it a day with the Perkins at that point, and next I wanted to get this platform painted to make it look even nicer. I got in touch with a structural engineer who came up with a plan to kind of fix everything, and it was a multi-step plan. So step one was dropping the floor joists in the back corner of the shop. Step two was to build all of these stud walls. We used two by sixes. They were built extremely strongly, but the main reason for building them out of two by sixes was so we could fit these five inch wide C5 by 6.7 is what they're called, steel C-channel pieces in the wall cavities. I got started on the process of installing the structural steel by laying out where exactly the pieces would need to be installed in the walls. And the structural engineer I worked with called for adding this steel C-channel at four foot on center increments along both exterior walls. And I'm the stud locations with red spray paint for easy identification. And this steel was extremely expensive at about $108 per 20 foot stick. And in total, I needed 18 of those 20 foot sticks for a grand total of more than $2,000 in steel C channel after tax. Anyway, after laying out the steel locations, we needed to come back and add blocking above where the steel would be installed in this right wall and the steel would be attached to the floor system above with six inch lag screws. And without this blocking, the steel would only have been attached to the top plates instead of being tied into the entire second level floor system. While the Ray J guys worked on the blocking, Eric and I worked on getting these massive three quarter inch wedge anchor bolts installed. And these bolts will provide an extremely strong connection between the bottom plate and the slab. And I installed them at a two foot on center spacing as specified by the engineer. From there, we just kept working our way down the wall and called it a wrap on this prep day once the blocking work was done. A few weeks later, once I had bought the huge pile of steel C-channel, we could get started on fabricating and installing these steel supports. We got started by cutting the three inch long pieces of three inch angle iron, and these would be turned into the mounting brackets for the steel supports. While Jason worked on cutting the brackets, Ray worked on drilling the holes for the lag screws, which will attach the top of the supports to the floor system. And the engineer called for two lag screws at the top of each steel support, so these brackets needed two holes. To mount the steel supports to the slab, the engineer specified more of those three quarter inch wedge anchor bolts, so we needed to switch to a larger hole saw for these holes. And we only needed one hole per bracket on these bottom brackets. 
The welding work was going super smoothly and we could tell we were getting the metal nice and hot with good penetration as we could actually see the glow of the puddle through the underside of the material, showing that the pieces were really fusing together nicely. Since this dual shield wire leaves a layer of slag on the finished weld bead, we needed to remove the slag with a chipping hammer between passes, and thankfully it came off super easy most of the time and the underlying welds were looking pretty darn good. Once the slag was knocked off, we hit the welds with a wire brush just to clean them up a bit, and then it was really just rinse and repeat. And Jamie and I really got into a groove welding and it was super fun getting back to it after over a year of being away from welding and we just traded off between welding and running the fume extractor. And we might have gotten a little carried away in our conversation as this happened. Wait, wait, wait. Good job, good job. Good job. Hey, Jason's good. trying welding for the first time and look what he's doing. Hey, I didn't do that. This guy did. Dude, did. right. When you drill the holes next time, you're supposed to drill them on this side What's of the What's really thing. funny. It's hot. Don't touch it. <laughs> both Jamie and I welded on this. We, we traded off. At it. We're yeah, standing we're here just, just looking at it. Hey, you want to know why? Remember what I said at lunch? <laughs> yeah. What I said yeah. at lunch? Well, we were talking about our vasectomies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are just comparing uh, vasectomy notes. Yeah. So, oh, so, yeah. Uh, you know. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Anyway, once we got a few supports welded up, Nate got to work priming the pieces with rusty metal primer. And this will keep the supports from rusting over the years and was another detail specced by the engineer. Also, you can see just how much heat we were putting into these pieces as the primer was sizzling even after giving the supports about 15 minutes to cool down. It's pretty crazy. Another detail to figure out was a method for labeling the supports, as each piece of C-channel was cut to length to fit in the wall sections, since we built these walls in place, so we needed to keep these pieces of steel organized. Of course, the Sharpie would be covered up by the primer, so we figured the easiest way to quickly label the parts was to just weld the number right onto the face of the C-channel. And as you can see, this worked great, and the numbers were easily visible even after painting. Once the primer had a chance to dry, we could get to work installing the supports in the wall, and this required a little persuasion in a few spots. And thankfully, we cut the pieces about a quarter inch short just to give ourselves a little wiggle room, but they were still tight in a few spots. To install the supports, the guys first got the support butted tight up to the block wall towards the center of the support, so the steel would brace the concrete block, which was <laughs> the whole point of installing it, and then they roughly leveled the support, making sure it wasn't proud of the 2x6 framing. Once the piece was in position, they could get the hole drilled in the slab, and I pulled out my monster of an SDS drill for this since we had so many holes to drill. After drilling, they vacuumed out the hole and then pounded in the wedge anchor before finally tightening it down with an impact wrench. At the ceiling, Ray pre-drilled holes for the lag screws and then drove in the screws with another impact wrench, and the screws landed on a joist or ladder blocking on this back wall. And between the two lag screws and the wedge anchor bolt, these steel supports definitely are not going anywhere. And I'm guessing we could remove the concrete block walls completely at this point if we wanted to. The Perkins guys kept chugging along installing the steel while Jamie and I kept welding. And we got the entire back wall and the first part of the side wall knocked out on this first day of steel work, which is nuts. And once again, I always underestimate just how much work we can get done when the Perkins crew shows up, and big thanks to them for continuing to help out on this project. And that means that all of the structural work as part of this kind of shop renovation, at least here in the shop area, is done. So that means we can move on to getting the space a lot more finished out. So the next step in this process is going to be getting some insulation added, obviously. I had all the ceiling insulation removed previously because it was in pretty bad shape. For now, I need to get prepped for having the insulation installed. And that means removing all of this old electrical from the ceilings here, because obviously it's gonna be a lot easier to remove that stuff without insulation in my way. As I've mentioned, I'm pretty much gutting the electrical in the shop space. It's very dated. None of the outlets were grounded. A lot of it was kind of messed up by the previous owner. There's a lot of kind of rat's nest of wiring in some of these junction boxes. So I'm just gonna start from scratch and that way I can run outlets exactly where I want them because obviously all my tools are gonna need specific outlets for where they're gonna go and none of that would have been here already. So the first step when working on electrical is making sure you're not gonna get shocked. So I went ahead and killed the power to the sub panel, which powers most of the circuits in the main shop area. I also double checked the sub panel with a multimeter just to make sure I wasn't gonna zap myself while working in the open panel. 
Now that I was gonna be removing the fluorescent lights, I could finally get rid of the extension cord running to the open junction box, courtesy of the previous owner, which had been powering these lights. Next, I started removing some of the disconnect boxes and junction boxes, and again, I just double checked everything with a voltage tester just to be sure the power was off since there is another sub panel that powers a few of these circuits. And I'm gonna hang on to these boxes as I can probably reuse some of them when I rewire the shop in the future. Once the boxes were removed, I started taking the conduit apart, and once again, I'll be saving some of this conduit to reuse later, and any of the pieces with lots of bins will be thrown out, but I probably still salvaged a few hundred bucks of conduit while taking all this stuff apart. Once I had most of the conduit run disassembled for each circuit, I could trace the wires back to the panel and get them disconnected so I could pull the wire. And my plan is to recycle all this copper and with the current price of copper, this should hopefully cover a lot of the costs of the new wire that I'll need. From there, I just continued pulling down conduit and tracing the wires back to the panel, and I pulled a ton of wire out of these runs. And a lot of these were for three phase outlets, so there were typically four or even five wires in each run of conduit. I also pulled down anything else that would get in the way of the insulation installers, including the old PVC airlines, and I wrapped up the day by getting this big run of wires pulled out back to the other sub panel in this edition. Well, <laughs> it is fairly dusty work here. It was pretty dusty. You can see it is uh it's time to take a shower but got really really good progress made pretty much pulled out all of the conduit and electrical and fluorescence in the main shop area so i'm just gonna go like say there i mean what's the problem i, I don't really yeah it looks fine i mean this good airflow. If I was a snake though, and I saw that, I'd probably want to crawl right into your shop. That's exactly what happened. Exactly. And so that gutter nail, that was the culprit, you think? I think, so basically on the other side, there's a hole just like this, but the wood is so rotten that the nail won't stay. So it's just coming out. And so the gutter fills up or water runs in the gutter. I think it's just running right through that hole and down into your snake entrance. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think we can fix it. All right. Oh, that was as crooked as could be. <laughs> Try again. There we go. Hey, want to hear the most annoying sound in the world? The key to this project being a success is me not cutting through the backside of your gutter and the inside here and making the situation worse. But I think I can use the blade itself to tell me when to stop. So it's right at that little logo there. I feel like the whole face of the board is rotten. It's, yeah. It's just going. Yeah. So for any viewers wondering how we're filming this, like he's not floating. <laughs> we're both standing on the same ladder really close together. Dueling ladders. Um, so. Trying to fight off this carpenter bee. This is a good ladder for that though. Oh yeah. I think way. you could just blow on it and it come out. Oh, yeah. Jeez. There we go. Wow, slightly rotten. Jeez, nasty. Yeah, so. Oh yeah, look, look at the face right here. <laughs> There's that much of that left. Wow. I hear that bee again. Uh, you look good out there? I'm all good in here, so I'm gonna scab it in. Ooh, there's that bee. Jeez. Oh, <laughs> Free fiber, bud. Yeah. The next big step in the shop renovation was to get the new insulation installed in the walls and ceiling. And I went with R30 insulation in the ceiling, which is well above the code requirement of R19 in this area, since this shop is considered an attached garage. 
Eventually, I'll have the entire attic area insulated as well, so R30 was probably a little overkill, but I figured it'd be worth it since I don't know when I'll have the budget to insulate the huge attic space. The insulation crew started by getting the bats installed in the ceiling, and these guys are incredibly fast at their job. And this is the same crew I used at my old shop and in the tiny house, and I highly recommend them if you're in the Asheville area. Thankfully, most of the floor joists were on layout, but in the few areas where the layout was off, the crew used these tiger claws to help hold the bats in place. While part of the crew worked on the ceiling insulation, the spray foam crew got set up for spraying the walls in the shop area and the ceiling in the addition with closed cell spray foam. And they started with the walls and the first step was to get the floor masked off as this spray foam will stick to pretty much anything and is next to impossible to remove once it's stuck to something. Once that was done, they got to spraying, and in my case, they were only spraying a fairly thin layer of foam about an inch and a half thick, and that's because I went with the flash and bat method of insulating these walls, meaning the crew would be adding a layer of bat insulation on top of the spray foam. I went with flash and bat mainly to save money since I had enough mineral wool insulation that I'd brought from the old shop to insulate these walls. And the main purpose of the closed cell spray foam in this case was to air and moisture seal the walls, and that's one of the big advantages of closed cell spray foam. Once the walls in the shop were sprayed, they moved to the addition, again starting by getting everything masked off, which was quite the process in and of itself. After masking, they started spraying more closed cell spray foam, and in this case they sprayed a thicker layer at about 3 inches thick, which is about R21, since this would be the only insulation in this ceiling. With the spray foam crew's work wrapped up, the mineral wool could be installed on top of the closed cell foam in the shop walls. And I really appreciate the guys doing this for me as I know working with reused insulation isn't the most fun process since a lot of the pieces were already cut into shorter sections. Once the mineral wool was installed, the insulation crew called their work done and the insulation was looking great. There was one other thing to do before calling the insulation totally done though, and that was to come back and add furring strips across the bat insulation and the ceiling. So since I'm going with a drop ceiling in the shop instead of something like drywall, there won't be anything to keep the insulation in place over the years, and without something like these furring strips, it would have the tendency to fall out of the ceiling, which would obviously defeat the purpose of the insulation. And Nate got the entire shop done, and then we could officially call the insulation work complete. All right, guys, so the insulation is in, as you saw, and as you can probably hear, it is super, super quiet in here. It's always a little shocking every time I get insulation installed, how much of a difference it makes in the space. But everything is looking really good. The temperature is feeling pretty good in here. You know, this shop is kind of half below ground. So even though it's the middle of summer, like 90 degrees outside, it's about 73 in here, which is pretty awesome. One thing though, the humidity is super high. We've had a ton of rain in Asheville this summer. Uh, there's also still been a little bit of water getting in through this wall over here. Uh, I did have the gutters cleaned and that has helped a lot with that. But I think between all of that and then also just moisture coming up through the slab, the relative humidity in here was sitting right around 80%, which is way higher than you wanted. Usually, you know, you kind of want in the 50% range. So it's been about a month since the insulation went in and I came in the shop and started looking around and noticed some weird stuff uh, kind of hanging off some of my shop furniture. And I thought, Maybe it was just bits of the insulation that had fallen and was kind of hanging, but upon closer inspection, it is mold and a lot of mold. It is absolutely disgusting. It's showing up on pretty much any unfinished wood in this space. Mold loves unfinished wood. It's an organic material. And so I'm gonna have to do something to deal with this mold. So I've called a local mold remediation company here in Asheville. The mold remediation company came out to give me an estimate and as expected, the moisture was incredibly high in the space, which led to the mold growth. And the mold remediation company recommended I work on getting the mini splits up and running in the space as soon as possible, as that would help to keep the moisture down and the mold at bay. Because of that recommendation, instead of installing all of the plywood on the shop walls, which was going to be next on my list, I got to work on the mini split installation. So in total, I'm gonna have two Mr. Cool multi-zone mini split systems in the shop space. The shop area will have two 18,000 BTU heads and one 12,000 BTU head in the CNC room, and the addition and spray booth will each have 18,000 BTU heads in those spaces. And with how well insulated the shop is now, this should make for an extremely comfortable and efficient workspace. 
After unboxing, I figured out where exactly this first indoor unit would be mounted, and these units need to be mounted at least six inches below the ceiling, and I made sure to factor in where the drop ceilings would end up when coming up with this location. After laying out the mounting location, as well as where the hole for the line set needed to be drilled, I got the mounting bracket installed on the wall, making sure to drive a few of the screws into the studs. Next, it was time to drill the giant hole through the wall, and I pulled out my beast of an SDS Max drill for this. Unfortunately, the four inch concrete bit I had didn't really want to cut through the plywood, so I cut the hole with the jigsaw and then got back to drilling. Since I had about 14 inches of wall thickness to drill through between the eight inch concrete block and two by six wall framing, I needed to use a super long bit, and thankfully I had picked up this beast for this project. And I was amazed at how cleanly this bit drilled the hole and couldn't believe really how quickly this process went with the right tool for the job. Next, I could get the unit prepped for mounting, first bending out the line set and then taping the condensate line to the bottom to make sure the condensation would drain properly. Finally, I could feed the communication wire and the line set through the hole, and of course, I didn't start my camera for this, but once that was done, the indoor unit just snapped onto the mounting bracket and it was good to go. Once that was done, I could get the other half of the included plastic conduit installed outside, and I added some sealant just to help hold this in place. I repeated the process one more time to get the last of the three indoor units, which will run off of this outdoor unit installed in the CNC room, and then I could move on to the electrical work. It's getting hot in here. <laughs> Need to get these mini splits turned on. So anyway, now that I've got the three indoor units mounted, now I need to get to wiring the outdoor unit. So I'm gonna start with the electrical. It's raining outside, so I figure I'll do the work I can do inside first. I'm gonna be using eight gauge wire. I'm gonna be running it through some conduit. And then once I get outside, I'll be transitioning to PVC conduit, so it'll be nice and watertight. We stopped short of the end of the run so we could get the condenser set in place. Finally, we moved the condenser in place, and let me tell you, that thing was not light. Next, I could start getting the line set run to the condenser from the three inside units. And this is a fairly simple process. I just needed to be careful not to kink or damage the copper lines while working on them. The line set attaches to the indoor unit with a pair of threaded connections, and it's important to make sure these are threaded on without cross-threading, which can lead to leaks. Next, I ran the communication wire to the condenser and connected the wires to the terminals, all of which are very clearly labeled. And the communication wire provides power to the indoor units, but also allows the remote to control the outdoor unit through the wire. And then I could open up all of the valves to check for leaks. So these lines are pre-charged with refrigerant, so it's really ideal to check for leaks along the way, but it's absolutely critical to check for leaks after opening these valves on the condenser, as that allows more of the refrigerant to flow into the lines. I used this gas leak solution to check the connections, both at the condenser and where the line set connected to the indoor units, and thankfully, I had no leaks. Before pulling the wire through the PVC conduit, I needed to finish the run to the outdoor unit, starting by installing a service disconnect. And these are required by code, so a service technician can quickly kill the power to the unit if they need to work on it. I'll also need to add a 120 volt outlet near this unit as well, so the technician will have power to do their work. Finally, I got everything wired to the breaker and could flip it on. Hey, I'm about to flip it on, so um, just I guess maybe go back by the outdoor unit and let's make sure nothing happens. Oh, sh After scratching my head for a few minutes, I realized I had wired the service disconnect incorrectly. And after fixing that, I could try the breaker again. Please, please, please. Yes. And thankfully it didn't trip this time, so I could test out the indoor units. As expected, they fired right up. And with that, I could call the mini split install a wrap, at least until I get to the other two units once the spray booth is cleared out. Thankfully, the Perkins crew had just wrapped up their last house project, so they were able to help me out with finishing the rest of the plywood install. And as soon as the guys started working, I quickly realized I was gonna run out of plywood, so Eric and I ran out to grab more materials while Ray, Jason, and Jono kept hanging sheets. I'm here with Johnny, and last time we loaded his Silverado at a box store, it broke the tailgate. Johnny's got a little footage of that. He's gonna roll for a second. <laughs> wow! I mean, what? This truck is freaking flat. That's impressive. Let's check out Johnny's tailgate because that was more of a load than 
I've ever seen on any regular truck. It did do a little, little damage here, kind of squished it there. And uh, otherwise though, it's shuts, so that's good. We're gonna see if this thing will hold 16 sheets of uh, drywall and then 10 more sheets of OSB. I'm, I'm interested to see. <laughs> nice and spread out, you know? I wanna point out, I love the fix that you did with the tailgate by getting a mountain bike cover yeah. thing for it. Yeah, and it uh, yeah, you can't tell it's broken and you look way cooler riding around. Yeah, I'm gonna sell my truck with that installed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for all the help. <laughs> That's not terrible. Still got you got some suspension left. Yeah, you're good. Slow down, buddy. Big out. We got a lot of weight. We made it. So if you didn't know, Johnny is kind enough to actually hire our crew to come here when we have like one day where we have nothing to do, which is really nice. Cause it's hard to get a job in construction that only lasts one day and then you're free and clear and you can just walk from it. So. Thank you very much, bud. Thank you all. It's uh, it's very disappointing when I don't have the burden. <laughs> <laughs> I know that feeling. Like, Man, yeah. work is getting done so slowly. Yeah. It's uh, amazing what we can get done when y'all are here. Well, while the guys kept chugging along hanging plywood, Eric and I got to work hanging drywall on the outside of the CNC room. Why drywall, you might ask? Well, after doing some research, I decided to add a layer of drywall to both the inside and outside face of the walls of the CNC room and the dust collection closet to hopefully help with the soundproofing. Thankfully, the drywall insulation went super quick, largely due to the fact that I have a collated screw gun. And these things make hanging drywall a breeze, and I'd highly recommend picking one up if you have a big drywall project coming up. The rest of the Perkins crew caught up to us just as we finished adding drywall to this first wall, and they also had to notch around these steel I-beams on this top row. And we'll be adding some kind of trim to clean this up later on. So as you can see, the guys just hung the plywood right on top of the drywall once they got to that section, and I guess we'll see how well soundproof that room ends up being. So we're ripping down some drywall to 23 and three quarters, and we're trying a couple different methods to see what's fastest. Johnny showed me the little uh, pro tip of how the real drywallers do it using a tape measure as a gauge, your finger as a guide, and your blade. <laughs> my finger is burning. Super easy. Ah! Dude, it was burning my finger off on that top edge. Dude, you look so natural doing that. Yeah, man, smooth as silk. Uh, it's Just, not real straight. You know, it, it'll still fit. Good enough. You gotta practice to get good is yep. what I'd say. This is a good place to practice. Tight down that bad boy. Oh yeah. You see it? Straight. We'll see if it fits. Like a glove. You know, I think I'm gonna stick with the old T-square. And it worked. Tried and true. My other technique didn't turn out too accurate, but it's hard to mess this one up. It is. Uh, well, it's not hard actually. With no. Two-sided blade. It's mm -hmm. not a single side on that. I can very easily like. Burp. What always happens to me is. That oh, it does in. like that. Yeah, you know, so you're pushing too what hard. What you gotta do? You gotta get your leg up on it like that. See that? Yeah. I'll teach you that in carpenter school. The old carpenter <laughs> straddle. That one's for the ladies. <laughs> From there, the guys kept hanging plywood while Eric and I turned our attention to mounting some flat two by fours to the block wall on the left side of the platform so that we could hang more plywood on this wall. Unfortunately though, I was running into a little trouble with my screws grabbing. We're moving on to this wall and tack conning these furring strips on. We're having some trouble. I don't, yeah. we don't know what the issue is, but. I had the same issue when I was doing the mini splits out back. These tap cons just do not want to grab. They're just spin out. They're spinning speed. out. One trick we used at the old shop, because we kind of ran into the similar thing, was to use a little length of string trimmer line. And you stick that in the hole after you drill your hole. And just adding that little bit of plastic helps the threads grab a little bit tighter and keeps it from spinning. So I think we might go out and buy some, some string trimmer. We got the cheapest string trimmer line you can buy. And we're going to try some of these, these cut nails. I've never seen these. <laughs> Johnny, they work. Like I've nailed a lot of stuff to concrete with those things. We'll see. Got to have a steel face hammer though. All right, Grandpa. <laughs> yeah, back in my day, we didn't have these fancy screws. Yeah, that's a lot better. Pro tip. Pro tip. Get your string line. Yeah, that's hitting hard. Much better. 
Wanna try a cut nail? Yeah, let's try a cut nail. All right, now we can try the cut nail. Yeah. It's a lot of work. Dang, yeah, that definitely holds. What you... <laughs> I might want to What was that? Uh, out of breath for a second. It would be good to use a two pound sledge or something. With yeah, those. yeah. Uh, that was that was a lot of work. I got a 10 pound That's sledge. too much sledge for me. You think? I'm not so sure I can even do it, but we'll get it started. And then <laughs> take the square side. Yeah, you can do that and I'll uh, I'll do my string trimmer line. Okay, yeah. So Tatcon's definitely the way that you teach you. <laughs> See, I remember doing that when I was younger and it wasn't that hard. Yeah. Um, maybe I was in better shape. It looks physically demanding. My dad just made us do stuff the hard way, I guess. Man. But that holds. Yeah, it holds. That sucks. <laughs> I made you buy them. Yeah, so I'm glad $10. I have a box I'll, of 50 of them. Yeah, I'll burn them up for you. <laughs> Cheers. Jason, I got a job for you. Masonry nails. Uh, good things. <laughs> <laughs> he usually loves sledgehammers. Why don't you just use cat count? <laughs> <laughs> While Eric burned through those masonry nails, I kept going with the Tapcons and string trimmer line, and we got most of these 2x4s mounted before calling it a day on day one with the Perkins crew. Unfortunately, with the block walls being so bowed, we had to use 2x4 trim on this back wall to cover the gap between the subfloor and the wall. Thankfully, we could use 1x4 trim on the other two walls, and this was all material I salvaged when I moved out of the old shop. Where the platform stepped down to the slab, I transitioned to using some leftover PVC trim from the not-so-tiny house build. And PVC is pretty ideal here since it's impervious to moisture, but even with that, we still gapped the baseboard up off the slab by about half an inch, just for good measure. We continued with the PVC trim on the other walls of the shop, leaving that same half-inch gap there as well. We also added a vertical piece of trim where the plywood met the concrete block wall at the end of this run, and the plywood was held back here to keep it from contacting the exterior block wall. When splicing two pieces of trim, we cut a 31.6 degree miter at the end of the piece, and the number didn't really matter here as long as the angles were the same, but 31.6 degrees is a common setting on most miter saws. I also left a small gap for caulking the joints later, and the gap just gives the caulk somewhere to go. Once the baseboards were on, we worked on some of the outside and inside corners, starting with this outside corner by the CNC room. And we just used two pieces of 1x4 here, nailing them in place. For the inside corners, we were able to use some of the French cleat trim from the old shop. And this trim was used at the old shop to cover the seams between the two rows of plywood, but it won't be needed here since we'll be filling any seams and then painting the plywood. We pre-assembled the corner boards, nailing them together, and then nailed them in place in the corners. And this really helped to account for any out of squareness, which most of these corners ended up being, and any small gaps will be caulked prior to paint. We repeated the process on the inside corners outside the dust collection closet, and then on the work platform. And I found my narrow crown stapler was perfect for assembling these inside corners, as I could use shorter staples, which reduced the chance of them curving out through the face of the trim. The last corner to deal with was this funky outside corner outside the spray room. And the block above this steel I-beam had kind of been broken at some point in the building's history and I figured I could pretty easily cover it up since it didn't really serve any structural purpose. I started by adding one face of the corner trim and I also added a temporary 2x4 to make sure this board aligned with the other trim piece to be installed. I nailed the board in place and removed the 2x4 then I could add the second trim board. And this board went all the way to the ceiling, kind of boxing in the end of the I-beam, which would allow me to trim it out later on. With that trim piece in place, I could fill in the last piece of plywood on the wall to close that up, and then I could repeat the process around the corner to cover up the broken block. And this ended up working great, and will also give me a better surface to attach the drop ceiling board or two later on. Once that was done, I could turn my attention to trimming out the door opening to the CNC room. I decided to keep it super simple and just use some scrap maple plywood for my jams since my door hinges will attach through the face of the walls, not to the jams. I nailed the jams on all three sides of the door opening and then before adding the trim, I needed to cut away the excess baseboard where we had left it long previously. And this was easy with an oscillating multi-tool and I like using a straight piece of scrap as a guide when making these kinds of cuts. I added the door trim afterwards using a mix of PVC and wood and with that, the trim was pretty much done. 
So as I'm sure you'll remember, I ended up having some pretty nasty mold growth in the shop, and before painting, I wanted to get the mold remediation work done so the mold didn't get trapped behind the paint. Before the mold remediation guys came to fog the building, I needed to spread some things out in the shop to make sure the fog hit every surface. And by far the most cramped area in the shop was the spray room, which I've been treating as kind of a storage unit, and so I spent some time unpacking it. Unfortunately, I also unearthed a ton more mold growth in this room, which makes sense as it's been closed off from the rest of the space. Once again, plywood and sheet goods seem to be the worst impacted by the mold, as you can see from the mold growth on a lot of my shop furniture. Luckily, after the fogging process, all of this mold should be biologically dead, so I can clean off everything and salvage it from ending up in the dumpster. Once the spray room was done, he moved into the main shop area, which again was divided into three spaces. Also, in case you're wondering, the fog does not damage cast iron or other surfaces, which definitely isn't true about the mold spray I had used previously. The only thing this fog will affect is brass and it'll just discolor it. Shade also made sure to fog the mini split units and the dehumidifier since there were likely mold spores in both of those units. The same goes for my central AC system in the office space, and we ran the fan on the unit to pull the fog into the ductwork and air handler. Finally, he fogged the last section of the shop area, and that was a wrap for the first floor. The last step in the process was a mold viability test, which essentially checks to ensure the mold was actually biologically dead, and Shade came back to take samples a few days later. Thankfully, the results confirmed the mold was, in fact, dead, RIP, so I can clean up the mold from the surfaces around the shop as I get to them. With the mold remediation done, we could finally get to work prepping the walls and trim for paint. And this was a pretty massive undertaking as I wanted these plywood walls to look as nice as they could. We started by filling all the screw holes and seams with spackling, and this ready patch compound seemed to work great on this plywood. It dried super hard and sanded really well. After spackling, we sanded the walls, making sure to sand down any excess spackling. After sanding, I got to work caulking all the seams between the trim and walls, which was a lot of work considering the sheer amount of trim there was to caulk. The last bit of paint prep work was filling in the plywood around the steel I-beams, which run through the shop. I filled these openings in using the same method as the outlet box holes, first attaching a piece of backer plywood inside the wall. Next, I cut and fit pieces to fill in the area using a sander to match the curve on the beam. And I mainly focused on the bottom half of the pieces since the top half will be covered by the drop ceiling later on. Once the filler pieces were installed, I could spackle around them, but first I vacuumed off the insane amount of dust left over from when this building was a cabinet shop. I added the spackle filling in the screw holes in any large gaps and left it to dry for a few hours. Once it was dry, I sanded down the excess spackle and then caulked the seams to smooth things out even more. And here's the final look after painting, and I think this method worked great. And with that, the paint prep was done. With everything looking good, I got my scaffolding moved into place, put on my respirator, and got to spraying. I continued on down the right wall of the shop, making sure it hit all of the walls and trim with a good coat of primer, and as you can see, things were looking really good. I continued spraying, finishing up the CNC room, and then I moved out to the work platform area to finish up the first coat. I switched over to another bucket once I drained the kills, using up some more primer that was left behind by the previous owner, and in total I sprayed about 10 gallons of primer for this first coat. And just for reference, this first coat took about 2 hours to spray, and I got it sprayed by lunchtime. This second coat didn't take nearly as much paint since the plywood was pretty well sealed at that point, and I used one 5 gallon bucket of paint on this coat. I also got this cool GoPro time lapse of this entire coat of paint, and I thought this was a pretty cool angle with the GoPro on the back corner of my scaffolding. As you can see, I would spray the top row covering roughly 20 to 30 feet at a time, then I'd hop down and spray the bottom row overlapping between the two rows. And this up and down spray pattern was a lot more taxing on my back, and I definitely felt it once I was done with this second coat. I wrapped up the second coat painting the cabinet that was already here, and this thing is really well built and in pretty great shape, so I figured I'd keep it and just give it a little facelift. And with that, the second coat was done, and the walls were looking great. Well, <laughs> I guess now, we know what, uh, what I'm gonna look like in about 10 years once more my gray hair comes in. That's pretty weird. <laughs> but glad I was wearing a respirator because otherwise this stuff would have been in my lungs. So 
always wear your respirator when spraying, especially a big room like this. After letting the paint dry overnight, I came back to some fairly rough walls, and this was because the water-based primer and paint I used raised the grain on the plywood, which is something I knew was going to happen. Once the walls were sanded, I got set up for the third and final coat, spraying more of the Valspar 2000 paint. And just like the second coat, I went through pretty much the entire 5-gallon bucket with just a tiny bit of paint left over. With that cleaned up, I wanted to finally start getting a few things organized now that the walls were painted. First on the list was my lumber rack, and I started by ripping some 2x4s down into 2x2s to use as mounting guides for the brackets. I'm using the same fast cap metal brackets I used in my last shop, and you can see how the bracket is designed to work with a 2x2 to make wall mounting go super quick. And I spaced the brackets 32 inches apart, or every other stud, except for the very last column of brackets, which needed to be 16 inches apart to support 16 foot boards. With the brackets mounted, I could finally get the rack loaded up, and it was so nice to be able to get the leftover framing lumber we brought from the old shop up off the floor. And as you can see, I've got 10 foot, 12 foot, and 16 foot boards on here, and they're all nicely supported. The next storage system to get set up was my brand new pallet rack from Global Industrial. And my plan is to stock up on plywood, hopefully when the prices go down some, and have quarter inch, half inch, and three quarter inch plywood ready to go so I can quickly load the sheets right onto the CNC. I had a fairly close call with one of the uprights falling right behind me, and thankfully I walked away from this unscathed, as this could have been a lot worse. I added the second shelf about 30 inches above the first, and this should be low enough to still easily pull plywood off of the top shelf. Last but certainly not least on the list was getting my French cleat wall hung up. And I've been using this French cleat wall for years now and love not only its storage utility, but also how it looks as a filming background. The last thing I wanted to do prior to hanging my tools on the wall was to knock down the sharp edges on the cleats since it's really easy to catch a knuckle on these when grabbing a tool. I used a block plane for this and was also able to smooth out some of the areas where the rows didn't quite line up between the panels. Once that was done, I could start getting things hung back on the wall, starting with my drill charging station. Next, it was time to go through the box of tool holders I had built, and these were also pretty dang filthy. I gave them each a quick vacuum as I unpacked them and then got them mounted on the wall, using a screenshot from a video at my old shop as a cheat sheet to help me put everything back the way it was. I also went ahead and added one more French cleat to the left of the panels to hang some of my longer clamps and my most used ladder. And with that, the French cleat wall was done for the time being. With the weather finally cooling down here in Asheville, it was time to turn my attention to the grading work outside the shop. So as many of you have seen, there have been some moisture issues inside the shop, and while these have largely been solved by getting the gutters cleaned and functioning, I figured I should go ahead and tackle the exterior grading work as well. So the main problem area was to the right of the shop, and as you can see, the grading here was about as bad as it could be, funneling any surface water right towards the shop walls and foundation. To fix this, my plan was to essentially just shift the dirt around with the end goal of the water being diverted into a swale, kind of a small valley about eight feet from the building. To start, I needed to do a lot of clearing work, removing the grass, small stumps, and trees, which were gonna be in my way. An organic material does not compact well and roots and stumps will rot over time, causing a lot more issues, so I wanted to get rid of as much of the brush, grass, leaves, and other plant material as I could. This was also really good practice so I could get back into the swing of things operating the excavator before I got closer to the building. I did also decide to go ahead and take down this larger tree since it was in the way of the grading work and also dumped a ton of leaves right into my gutters. Taking this thing down required quite a bit of digging around the base of the tree, but eventually I got it pushed over and dragged it into the woods behind the shop. From there, I just continued clearing brush around the back of the shop and then wrapped up day one with a little dingo work to start backfilling the area near the right shop wall since I was getting down to some good quality dirt finally. I started day two with some more backfilling, this time with the excavator, but while digging, I also found the old clogged corrugated drain line underground, and it was of course surrounded by a bunch of roots, so I worked on digging those up before continuing. Once that was done, I could start backfilling in earnest, and I was able to really start building up the soil level against the wall by taking buckets of dirt from the area where I wanted to create the swale. 
Between passes, I compacted the soil by running over the area with the excavator, tracking it in, and you can see I got a little too close to the building as the soil compacted and ended up denting one of the metal siding panels slightly. As I got close to where I wanted to be depth-wise for the swale, I ran into what seemed to be a trash and burn pit from when the building was originally built back in the 70s. And I found offcuts of the metal siding, old beer cans, and chocks, which matches up with the building being a chop shop at one point in its history. I threw away what I dug up and kept digging, only to find some more beer bottles. These guys were pretty thirsty, evidently. And I found some pretty cool antique Stroh bottles, which I went ahead and recycled. From there, I continued cleaning up the grating, widening the swale with the dingo, and smoothing out some of the areas before jumping back into the excavator to do more compacting. And I was able to really get things looking good at this point, with the swale starting to take shape and the grating at the wall looking pretty solid. I kept working around the back of the building, with my next target being the low point at the back left corner of the shop. Once again, I moved dirt around to backfill this area and found another trash pile back here. Thankfully, I was able to really clean up this area and get it smoothed out enough to be able to pull my truck around back, which will be super handy for getting things in and out of the attic space. I called it a wrap for day three at that point, and we ended up having some unexpected rain overnight, so I could see how the grating was working based on where the water was flowing. Thankfully, this whale was working as expected, diverting the water away from the building. And you can see this even worked where the gutter downspouts were draining out since the corrugated pipe was removed for the time being. And there was a giant puddle where I'd piled up the dirt at the bottom of the hill at the street. So I focused on getting that cleaned up with the dingo, piling up more dirt against the wall. Before finishing up the grading work, I needed to deal with the rearmost boarded up window opening. And I didn't want to just bury this area as I didn't want the fiber cement panel rotting over time. So I figured I could whip up a quick DIY window well. I dug out the dirt to about six inches below the window opening to leave room for adding some gravel inside the window well later. Once that was done, we could move the window well in place and then I could check it for level. And it was ever so slightly out of level, but a few taps with a hammer got it leveled out. Next, I could get the window well attached to the wall and I used some Tapcon screws for this. And I drilled the holes using my SDS drill and before adding the screws, I also added a bit of silicone just to help seal up the holes in the wall. The last thing to do to wrap up the grading work was to add some erosion control matting, and this will help keep the dirt from washing away. And I don't really want grass here since I don't want to add weekly mowing to my shop maintenance, and the straw matting will help keep things together while I figure out what I want to do over here. I got this matting from an agricultural supply store and it was super easy to install. We just rolled it out and tacked it in place with sod staples as we went. I cut the mat once we got to the bottom of the hill and started again from the top, overlapping the pieces by about two feet. We repeated the process for a third row, and once that was done, we could call the grading work complete. With the grading work done for the time being, the next big project on my shop building was adding a huge front porch or awning to the front of the building. And I figured while I had the excavator and dingo rented, I could go ahead and get started on the porch by digging the footings. So as with any construction project, I started with the layout work, getting a few string lines set up to represent both sides of the building, as well as where the posts for the porch will land. We continued on down the rest of the porch, marking the center of the post locations until we had marked all five posts. Once that was done, I could come back and mark out the footings, which were two feet by two feet square in this case. Now this was probably pretty massive overkill, but concrete is fairly cheap, and I figured giving ourselves some wiggle room on the post locations would be beneficial. After marking all the footing locations, it was time to bring in the machinery and start digging the footings with the excavator. I emptied the excess dirt into a wheelbarrow as I dug, and I'm so glad I did as we would have had a huge mess to clean up otherwise. So we were shooting for a footing depth of about 18 inches, which is below the frost line of 12 inches in this area. And you want the bottom of your footings well below the frost line, as this will prevent the footings from being shifted or damaged by frost heaving as the ground freezes and thaws through the colder months. After digging with the excavator, the footings still needed to be cleaned up by hand, and we found out just how hard this dirt was while cleaning up the footings. Once they were cleaned up, we could get the rebar added to reinforce the footings, and we used number four rebar here cut into 18 inch lengths, and I used four pieces arranged in a grid in each footing. We then repeated the process on the rest of the footings and were ready for concrete, at least I thought. 
After doing some more measuring, I realized I was going to come up short on the amount of concrete I had ordered, which was one yard in this case, unless I formed up the area where I had overdug the footings with the excavator. And if you've ever dug small square holes with an excavator, you'll know how hard it is to make those holes perfectly square, especially when you're dealing with dirt this hard. Thankfully, I whipped up some quick forms using scraps I had in the shop, and these really helped to reduce the overall volume of concrete I needed. I got the forms added just in time as the concrete truck rolled up about an hour later so we could get the footings poured. Thankfully, the driver was able to move the chute right above the footing so we didn't need a pump for this project. And this concrete was a standard 3000 PSI mix and it had a pretty low slump which was good for my purposes. Since I ordered just enough concrete, we started by partially filling all the footings and then came back and topped them up just to make sure we didn't come up short. As the concrete was poured, we smoothed out the surface of the footing with a transfer shovel, a 2x4 as a screed, and even a small trowel. Anyway, we got all the footings poured with just enough concrete to top up the last footing, and then let the footings dry over the weekend before starting on the porch build. This first bracket would be centered on this line, so I moved my marks over 2 and 3 quarters of an inch, and then I could finally mark where I needed to drill the 5 8 inch hole for the 5 8 inch anchor bolt. Also, I used this cool dust collection attachment to help remove the dust created by drilling the hole, and concrete dust is incredibly bad for you, and I definitely recommend some kind of dust collection or respirator when drilling into it. The dust collection kit came with another attachment for vacuuming out the hole itself, which was also pretty handy. Once that was done, I could set the bracket in place, pound in the anchor bolt, and realign the bracket with my layout lines before checking for level. And thankfully, my footings were all pretty darn level, so I tightened down the anchor bolt and could call the first bracket done. These posts were super heavy and I definitely didn't want them falling over on us, so I added one screw through the bracket to hold the bottom in place and then added two 2x4s as diagonal bracing to keep the posts upright. Next I used a post level to get the posts mostly plumb so I could locate my stakes to secure the diagonal bracing. My first stake went in easy enough, but this second stake was just getting mangled since the ground was so hard here. And since we didn't need the jet stakes for the string lines anymore, I pulled those and used them for the bracing and they worked great. With the stake set, we got the post plumbed on two sides using a longer four foot level for more accuracy. And then I secured the diagonal bracing to the stakes to lock everything in place. Also, since the posts were now plumb, I could add the rest of the screws to attach the bottom of the post to the post base brackets, and Simpson calls for these 1.5 inch structural screws for this specific post base style. We got all the posts stood up and braced, and thankfully they all looked straight and plumb, so we could get them cut to length. To determine the length, I first marked the height I wanted the posts on the building, which was 10 feet in my case. I figured my rotary laser would be the best tool to help keep things accurately level across the long 54 foot run of this porch. So I got my reader location set on my grade rod based on that previous measurement. From there, I could bring the grade rod to the first post and get it aligned with the rotary laser using the very loud beeping sound from the reader to guide me. And once it was lined up, Nate marked the location at the top of the grade rod. I used a circular saw to cut the post to length, but this was a little tricky for a few reasons. First, you can't cut through a six x six with a standard circular saw, even cutting from all four sides. And second, I was making these cuts close to 10 feet up in the air. That said, I just took my time, moved around my ladder a few times, and got the four circular saw cuts done. At that point, all that was left was a small bit of material in the middle of the post, and a handsaw made quick work of this. I checked the cut for level and it looked good, so I could add the bracket, which will connect the girder to the post. And this is another Simpson Strong Tie product and they call for two and a half inch structural screws for this connection, so I swapped those here. I repeated the process on the second post in line and once it was cut to height and the bracket installed, I set a straight two by six across the two just as a quick sanity check and thankfully things were looking nice and level. We repeated the process on the rest of the posts, and I should also mention I used a chisel to clean up any bits of excess material left in the center of the post after cutting. Once all the posts were cut to their final height, it was time to start getting the girders assembled, and I used a 2-ply 2 2x12 2 for the girders here. Once the board was cut to length, I crowned the board with the crown facing up, and then we got it lifted into place. And <laughs> this was easier said than done considering how much stuff was in our way between the diagonal bracing and the walkboard we had set up. Once the board was in place, I got a few screws added to the bracket just to help hold the board in place, and Nate repeated on his side. 
We got the second board in length, got it lifted into place, and then we could attach the two boards to each other. And this sounds pretty simple, but there are a few things to keep in mind when assembling girders like this. First, we made sure the two boards were plumb before screwing them together. And second, we made sure to straighten the boards as much as possible while putting them together, also making sure they were flush on the top edge. I used another trick I picked up from my buddy Eric Perkins here, adding a screw to the top edge of the lower board and using it to pry the board up and even with the other board. Once again, it's easy to get your girder out of plumb here, and I apologize for the camera angle, but we kind of ran out of hands between me prying and adding screws and Nate holding the camera and pulling the boards into plumb. After getting the boards flush on top and plumbed, I came back and added a row of three screws or nails every foot or so to really lock the two boards together into one beam. Finally, we could attach the beam to the bracket, and since these post cap brackets are designed for a triple ply beam, I needed to add a filler piece, another scrap piece of 2x12 in my case. And each of these brackets uses 18 of these 2.5 inch screws in total, and I'd say these beams definitely aren't going anywhere. Solid. We repeated the process on the next beam, which was also a lot shorter, just under 13 feet in this case. Next, I needed to cut more filler pieces using up the offcuts from the shorter beams, and I did this at my miter saw inside the shop. And I left these fairly long, around 18 inches, and I figured lapping this filler board between the two ends of the beams would help to tie everything together even further. From there, we just repeated the same process for the next two sections of girder, and before we knew it, the front half of the porch was really taking shape. To get started, I needed to attach the ledger board to the building, but first I had to cut away a section of the metal siding along where the ledger board would be located. To make the cuts, I used an angle grinder with a 6 inch cutoff wheel, and I was honestly kind of dreading this. Thankfully, this flex bolt angle grinder ripped through this siding, and it was surprisingly simple to connect my cuts between my marks and keep the cut running level. After cutting one panel, I went ahead and removed the offcut, and thankfully, things were looking good with the framing behind the panel, and my measurements matched up with my SketchUp model. I also went ahead and added a self-tapping screw at each stud, about seven inches up from my cut line, and this just kept the siding panels in place as I worked, and left me room to tuck flashing up under the siding later. Before continuing cutting, I also donned my welding jacket, welding gloves, and face mask to protect me from the shower of sparks. From there, it was really just rinse and repeat, and I cut as much of the siding as I could reach before having to move my walkboard. After finishing this first section, we moved the walkboard down the building, and then I continued cutting away metal siding, unearthing lots of old hornet's nests, spider webs, rat poop, and other treasures along the way. With the ledger board location marked out, it was easy to get the pieces attached to the building, and we initially just tacked them in place with 3-inch screws before coming back and adding a few lag screws. We continued on down the rest of the building and got all of the ledger board pieces mounted before calling it a day. I designed this porch so I could just cut these 16-foot yellowwood 2x6s in half for the rafters, and I went ahead and cut the 7-degree angle when making this cut to match my 1.5 to 12 roof pitch. Next, I marked out the distance from the angled end of the board to the heel of the bird's mouth, which I had measured for already, and then I could lay out my bird's mouth. From there, all that was left to do was to cut the bird's mouth, and I used a circular saw to make the bulk of the cut since it's pretty easy to get a straight square cut. I finished the cut with a jigsaw, which only needed to remove a small sliver left by the circular saw in this case. With that, the bird's mouth was cut so I could head outside to test the fit. I tacked the rafter in place with a screw and the fit looked good, although the filler board I had added at the end of the girder was a little proud of the other two girder plies and it was pushing the rafter up. I removed the rafter and pulled out my electric hand plane to bring the board flush and this was a little bit tricky up on the ladder. I got it done, but not before gouging the end of the girder slightly, which was definitely frustrating. I checked the fit again and it was looking much better, so I went ahead and marked my layout on the girder. I also measured and marked the length of each rafter, and these measurements were highly variable since this building is far from straight after settling and shifting over the last 50 years. To install the rafters, I initially toe screwed them in place, lining up the rafter with my layout lines and flushing the bottom edge with the ledger board. I only added a few screws to hold the boards in place initially, but came back and toe nailed the rafters with two to three nails on each side with my framing nailer later on. I wrapped up day three of the roof build by getting all of the rafters, aside from the fly rafters, installed, and overall the porch was really starting to take shape. The following day, we got started by removing the diagonal bracing to get it out of our way, and then we could get the rafter tails cut to final length. 
I'd left the tails long so we could trim them later, and this just makes installation go a lot faster. And this was surprisingly easy, especially with the walkboard set up so I could see my line easily. Once I had enough rafters cut down, we could get our first piece of fascia board installed while we had our walkboard set up. To help support the board, we screwed a scrap to the underside of a rafter at one end, and you'll also notice that we ran the fascia past the last rafter by 9.5 inches, since there will be one more fly rafter added later. I got the fascia screwed to the rafter at one end, breaking it on the middle of the rafter, and I used my speed square to line up the top edge of the rafter with the top edge of the fascia. As I went down attaching the fascia, Nate could raise or lower his end of the board to help line everything up, and it is so much easier doing this with two people. Once the fascia was attached to each rafter, we could come back and add the fly rafter. Unfortunately, I screwed up my cut here and cut the angle on one end in the wrong direction, so I had to recut this rafter first. Thankfully, I had ordered extra material, and once I had the new rafter cut, we got it installed. From there, we just repeated the process down the rest of the roof, cutting the rafter tails to length, and installing the fascia boards. And unfortunately, my camera died just before we attached the last fly rafter, but here's the finished rafters. The last bits of framing to add to the roof were the purlins, which run perpendicular to the rafters. And the metal roofing panels will be attached to these purlins, and we ran a row along the entire roof at a two foot on center spacing. Nate worked on installing the rest of the purlins, and I got to work on the last pieces of framing on the porch, the knee braces. I cut these from four by fours and cut them at four feet long from long point to long point. And this meant I could get two knee braces out of an eight foot long four by four. I started by countersinking the holes with a one inch forcer bit, and this will allow the head of the lag screw to sit below the face of the knee brace. After countersinking, I drilled a through hole with a three eighths inch twist bit. Finally, because I'm a woodworker at heart and love a good chamfer, I went ahead and chamfered the edges of the countersunk holes with this big countersink drill bit. And I think this was a really nice touch. With that done, we could finally install the knee braces, and unfortunately, we immediately ran into a problem. Somehow, I overlooked the fact that my hole locations would cause the lag screws to protrude through the top of the knee brace, so they'd be visible, which was obviously not a good look. Thankfully, this was a pretty easy fix, and I just cut about an inch off of each end of the boards, which brought the holes in line with the angled cut. After making the fix, we got the first knee brace positioned using the 45 degree bubble on this torpedo level to get the knee brace level. Once the brace was level, we tacked it in place with a three inch screw at each end, making sure it was flush with the face of the post and girder. Next, I used a long quarter inch drill bit to pre-drill the holes into the post and girder, and then I could finally drive in the lag screws with an impact driver. From there, we just repeated the process on the rest of the knee braces. We got the last knee brace installed and they were looking great, plus they really stiffened up the porch laterally. The last thing to do to wrap up the framing was to install the hurricane ties, and these help to secure the rafters to the girders and are required by code. Nate finished installing the rest of the hurricane ties, and with that, we could officially call the porch framing done. Before getting started installing the roofing panels, I needed to add the eave drip edge, which helps to protect the fascia from water. Next, we could work on getting the metal roofing panels installed, and I started the process by setting up a string line. And this string line will give me a reference when aligning the ends of the panels so there would be an even overhang along the entire roof. We lifted the panel up onto the roof, trying not to scratch the drip edge in the process, and then aligned the panel with the left edge of the roof and the string line. And there will be gable trim to cover the gable edges of the roof, so it didn't really matter if the panel was slightly off there as long as it was aligned with the string line. Next, I could add a few screws to tack the panel in place, and I measured up three and three quarters of an inch from the end of the panel, so my screw would be centered on the purlin below. Once the butyl tape was on, we could install the second panel, overlapping the ribs with the first panel and screwing it to the purlins with the same screw pattern. I did also add a lap screw where the two panels overlapped, which again helps prevent leaks on lower pitched roofs. From there, we repeated the process for another two panels, bringing the total to four panels installed, and then I hopped up on the roof to add the rest of the screws. I needed to add a row of screws every two feet on center where the panels met up with the purlins below, and I snapped a chalk line to help keep everything aligned, and this was a pretty simple, if not tedious, process. And once again, Best Buy Metals has the screw pattern for the center of these panels detailed in their instructions, and I just followed those as closely as possible. From there, we repeated the process for another five panels, with my drone almost creeping into a tree branch while we worked. Before we knew it, we were to the last panel. So this panel needed to be cut to width, and I figured setting it in place and marking it would be the easiest way to get an accurate cut. I made a mark at both ends and then connected the marks with a level, and then pulled out my weapon of choice for this job. 
and I used this special impact driver attachment to make this cut, and overall, it worked pretty well. It definitely cut fast, but I'm not sure if I was using it correctly since it left me with a super wavy cut. After cutting the piece to width, all that was left to do was install it, and with that, we could call the metal roofing panels installed, or at least tacked in place. I went ahead and got the rest of the screws added to fasten the metal panels, and it's kind of insane how many of these screws go into a roof like this. And pre-drilling the holes definitely helped to speed things up here. With all the screws added to the roof panels, I could get the rest of the trim installed, starting with the gable trim. I marked out where the trim intersected the metal siding, which would need to be cut away to allow the gable trim to tuck up under the siding. I got it cut and the trim fit well, plus there was room for the in-wall trim to tuck in above the gable trim. I used a level to get the gable trim aligned with the roof panels and then tacked it in place with one screw at the back and front of the trim so I could mark out where I needed to cut the other end. I marked a line flush with the roof panel on the top of the trim and then marked a plumb line on the side of the trim, also even with the roof panel and I started to try to cut this piece to length with it attached to the roof, but quickly realized that was not going to work, so I removed it and set the piece on sawhorses to finish making the cut. Before installing the trim, I also needed to add a strip of butyl tape where the top edge of the trim meets the roof panels, and this will keep water from working its way under the trim. Once that was done, I could get the gable trim installed, reattaching it in the same two screw locations as before, and then adding the rest of the screws. And now that the trim is installed, you can see how the finished end looks after installation. And there are a lot of ways to finish the end of this kind of gable trim, but I think this looks nice and was pretty simple to cut and fold. Next, I repeated the whole process on the other end of the roof to wrap up the gable trim installation. The last metal bits to add to the roof were the in-wall flashing pieces, and these tuck up under the metal siding and help to move the water from the siding to the roof. The basic process was to add a strip of butyl tape and these foam closures an inch back from the edge of the in-wall trim, and then tuck the trim up under the siding panels, which was a complete pain, as you'll see. So as you can see, doing this by myself was next to impossible, and if I managed to get one end of the trim tucked up under the siding, the other end would just pop out. And I struggled with this for way too long, cursing up a storm, and finally stopped so I could regroup and think of another solution. Thankfully, as it turned out, the solution was pretty simple. I realized I could just go up into the attic and jam a few scraps in between the framing and the siding to give me more room to tuck the trim under the siding. And I was actually able to pull this piece up behind the siding from inside the attic. From there, I continued installing more in-wall trim, and thankfully, I didn't have too much of a struggle getting the rest of the pieces added with my new attic scrap wood wedge method. Next, I could get the in-wall trim screwed to the roofing panels, but first I needed to clean up the mess from the caulk I had used where the trim pieces lapped. And this was supposed to dry clear, but instead was dripping white coloring all over this new black roof. So I wiped off the area and switched over to Lexel. And Lexel can be applied to wet surfaces, so it was really ideal here, and it's clear so it wouldn't make the same mess. I applied it to the lapped area as well as between the foam closure strips and the trim, and then I could add screws at each ridge to attach the trim. I also added a few screws where the trim pieces lapped to help seal the connection between the two pieces. From there, I could repeat the process down the rest of the roof, and let me tell you, I was completely worn out by the time this was all done. That was a ton of screws. Thankfully, the trim was looking really good, and most importantly, the roof should be totally watertight now. So with that, I could officially call the porch project a wrap. All right, guys, so the next big step in the shop renovation is gonna be doing all of the electrical work. So this is gonna be the main panel for this shop area. I actually have a total of four panels here at the shop. Because this building's so old, I think they basically just continued adding on over time. So it's been a bit of a challenge to kind of figure out exactly what was what, but I think I have a pretty good handle on it. And so now I can finally get started wiring the shop, which is really exciting because this whole time of uh, building out all of the stuff in here, I've been working on of two outlets. So this building is technically zoned mixed use, but I'm treating everything in here as commercial. And so I'm gonna be using a lot of more commercial grade materials for my outlet boxes. I'm gonna be using these 1900 boxes. They're 
four inches by four inches. They have a pretty good depth and that's gonna allow me to fit things like GFCI outlets. To attach the outlets to the boxes, I am using these metal face plates and I was actually able to pull these outlets out from my old shop in this configuration already pre-wired. So that's gonna make this super, super simple because with 120 volt circuits, first of all, I like to do every outlet as a quad outlet because in a workshop, you can never have too many outlets. But then the other thing I'm gonna do is for each run of 120 volt circuits, I'm gonna run two individual circuits and I'm going to wire each circuit to every other outlet box. So that means every five feet, I will have a box on a different circuit. So if I'm running two tools that are fairly power hungry, let's say my router table and a dust collector, both 120 volt tools, I can plug a one into one outlet, one into the other box, and I know that I will be on two separate outlets so I won't be tripping breakers, which is such a pain. So with the conduit and boxes installed, I could go ahead and start getting some of the rough wiring done. I went ahead and ran some of that MC cable from the panel back over to that first junction box. And if you're newer to electrical work and want to add some circuits to, let's say your garage shop, I would highly recommend checking out MC cable. It is very easy to work with. That said, I don't think it looks as good. That's why I'm mainly just using it up in the ceiling because it just makes my life easier since it's flexible and I can run it kind of wherever I want. I fastened the MC cable every couple of feet up to the joist and then where I terminated it into the junction box in the panel I use this dual MC cable clamp so that I can run two of the cables into one knockout and that just is going to save me some of my knockouts on my panel. After that, I went ahead and started running some of the THHN wire. And as you can see, I got this really cool little kind of dispenser, if you will, from Racketeers. And it allows me to have all five of my spools nicely organized and I can pull the wire off of it without it getting all tangled up. And I went ahead and ran it from the second junction box in the line of outlets here, since I'm gonna be running both wires from those GFCI outlets from the first box. And then I ran it up to the junction box at the ceiling so it can be connected to the MC cable. And this wire is really easy to feed, especially over these fairly short distances of only about five feet between boxes. I connected the MC cable to the THHN in the junction box with my new favorite electrical things, these Wago connectors. If you guys haven't heard of these, they replace wire nuts. And instead of having to do all of that twisting, which, you know, if you're doing a whole bunch of junction boxes over the course of a day, it can get really taxing on the hand. You just flip open the clips, feed the wire in and close the clip and you're good to go. I also got this really cool automatic wire stripper for this project and I can set the amount of sheathing to remove to match the amount that Wago recommends to make sure I have a really good connection on all of those connectors. So after wiring up the GFCI outlets, I went ahead and roughed in the rest of the wiring in this line of outlets. And again, I'm running each of these hot neutral wires to every other outlet. So in the outlet on the right here, I'm using the black and white wires. So the blue and gray wires pass right through uncut to the next box in line and so on and so forth from there. And again, I am so happy I went with that color coded system. It made it super, super simple to keep everything straight. And I think this is gonna be a great system for the whole shop. Once all the rough end work was done, I could go ahead and make up the outlet boxes. And first I needed to prep some of those outlets I pulled out of the old shop by mounting them in face plates. Again, I use those Wago connectors here. I use the five slot connectors for the ground wire. And then I use the three slot connectors for the hot and neutral, since I had one coming in, one going out, and then the two outlets were tied together with a pigtail. And between these outlets already being pigtailed together and that automatic wire stripper and the Wago connectors, I got these things knocked out in no time. And with that done, I could land all of the wires in the panel. I started by terminating the ground wires on that ground bar I'd installed. And once that was done, I terminated the neutrals on the neutral bar. And then finally, I could connect the two hots to two 20 amp breakers, get them installed in the panel, and then go flip the power back on at the main panel to the sub panel, flip on the sub panel disconnect, and then finally flip on the breakers. And one tip I read in the comments on my mini split install video was to always look away from the breaker when you're flipping them on in case there's a big arc, and that'll just protect you from super bright light or if anything flies out of the panel. And so I did that here, and thankfully there were no arcs. I was pretty confident I wired all this correctly. And once the breakers were flipped, on, I could test the GFCI outlets, both of which function fine. And then I used my little outlet tester to test the GFCI protection on the rest of the outlets on these two circuits. And as expected, they worked great. And with that, I was officially wrapped up with the first circuit installation here in the shop, which is really, really exciting. As I mentioned, I only had 
two outlets for this whole space before. And now I have one, two, three, four, five, ten sets of outlets here, which is amazing. So I started the install process by marking out the locations of the outlet boxes. And in my case, each one of these 240 volt circuits will be for one single tool. So these locations were pretty specific. And I went ahead and laid everything out in SketchUp. That was the first thing I did when I bought this building was go ahead and model it up so I could figure out exactly where everything went. Because a lot of times on these bigger power tools, the cord is not super long. So you at least want it in the general vicinity. Once the locations were laid out, I went ahead and mounted the outlet boxes. And again, I'm using these 1900 metal boxes, which have a little bit more depth. So a little bit more volume, which is really good for some of these 240 volt outlets, which can get pretty big. And once I mounted them on the wall, I also went ahead and added the connectors for connecting the EMT conduit to the boxes. So just like with the 120 volt outlets, I'm going to be using MC cable to get the wire from the panel to the outlet location and then switching over to EMT conduit. And so I needed to go ahead and cut some pieces of EMT and bend those box offsets and then mount a junction box up above where the drop ceiling will go. From there, I ran a bunch more wire. I had eight 240 volt circuits in total here in the shop. So that was a lot of MC cable. And I made sure to go ahead and label each wire as I ran them into the panel to keep from getting confused later on when I landed all the wires. Another thing I wanted to try to do before adding the outlets to these cinder posts was to get them plumbed. And I thought maybe I'd just be able to tap them with a sledgehammer, but uh, that was definitely not the case. No. <laughs> well. That might be fastened in some way. No. I didn't move it. So with that done, I can go ahead and start mounting some of the junction boxes to these center posts. And since these were steel, I obviously needed to drill and tap some holes. And for that, I used my favorite little drill and tap bits and they drill the hole, tap the hole and countersink the hole all in one quick motion. They just make this whole process super, super simple. And then I just use some 1024 machine screws to mount the boxes to the posts. The conduit bending work on these posts was a little bit tricky because I had to go around the beam up towards the ceiling. And so it took me a couple of tries, but really it was just another offset. And I used the bending app I've been using to get the measurements I needed. And it worked out after a few pieces of wasted conduit. So for this outlet behind me for my planer, I needed to use eight gauge wire and I couldn't find MC cable in that size locally. So I had to run EMT conduit all the way back to the panel. And after doing some detective work with my fish wire, I was actually lucky enough to find a existing run of conduit coming out towards kind of the center of the shop. And then from there, I just pieced everything together using plenty of junction boxes, making sure I had plenty of pull points. And once I had all the conduit run, I could go ahead and pull the wire, which was really simple with all of those junction boxes. I repeated the process for the last couple of 240 volt circuits, which were the furthest from the panel over in the CNC room. And unfortunately I ran out of that MC cable. So I had to do another run of EMT all the way from the panel, which was definitely a pain. And I didn't put as many junction boxes. So it was a little bit tougher to pull. I did use that fish wire and it was a pretty good workout, but eventually I got it pulled through. So once all those wires were run, I could go ahead and land them all back here in the panel. And one thing I did have to do with the MC cable was go ahead and black out all of the white neutral insulation because with these circuits, those white neutral wires are gonna be used as one of the hots. And this is something we did at the old shop because we used MC cable there as well. The inspector passed that with no problem. So I think in the case of MC cable, it's okay, but that might vary in your area. And as you can see, I used my label maker to go ahead and label all of those incoming wires, which get confusing in a hurry. And this really helped when I was laying everything out and testing everything once everything was wired up. And will also obviously make it a lot easier when I go to label the faceplate of the panel with all of the circuits. So once everything was landed back at the panel, I could go ahead and make up all of the outlet boxes and I left this one so I could show you guys. It is super simple. I think I know I personally was very intimidated by 240 volt circuits thinking, oh, it's twice the power. It must be twice as difficult or something. But in the case of all of these power tools, it's actually even easier because I have two hots and one ground. There's no neutral. The hots, it doesn't matter which side of the outlet you put it on. These are the style of outlets I like to use where you can just put the wire straight in. 
I had started to try to use another style of outlet, which is what I had wired up my bandsaw with at the old shop, since again, it only needs 20 amps, but bending this stranded wire into a hook is a total pain, and I didn't have any of the kind of ring terminals here at the shop to crimp on, so I went ahead and just switched over to one of these, and once again, since I ran 10 gauge wire to these boxes, this is a 30 amp rated outlet, so in case I do want to bump up my bandsaw at some point, I can do that very easily. So with that, the 240 volt outlets were done. So I could go ahead and continue on with the 120 volt outlets, which there were a whole bunch more to install. And so I started here on the kind of French cleat wall and the, I guess, work platform. I don't really know what to call this area, but my kind of woodworking workbench area, I guess. And on the French cleat wall, there are a lot of little kind of weird bins to get around the French cleats themselves. And I actually already had some outlet cutouts from when I had put up the French cleat wall at the old shop. So I went ahead and put the new boxes there. Just repeated the process on along the rest of this back wall and the right side wall and there were a whole bunch of outlet boxes here i spaced them about every five feet and it seems like overkill right now but honestly i don't think anybody's ever said you know i wish i had less outlets once I got to the end of this run, I wanted to continue it on into the CNC room. And so to do that, I just drilled a hole through the wall and then added a junction box on the other side with a piece of EMT conduit to connect the two boxes. And I did go ahead and seal that box to the wall with some Lexel, again, to hopefully soundproof that CNC room as much as possible. And then I could go ahead and pull the wire to all the junction boxes. And this time, rather than trying to go box by box and kind of pulling wire between each one, I pulled wire from the very end of the run to the very beginning of the run, all five wires. And then once I had done that, I just pulled out a little loop at each box to give me enough slack to wire up the outlets. I would highly recommend that if you're making up a long run of junction boxes like this. Next, I went ahead and made up the boxes. And as I mentioned, I had a whole bunch of outlets to deal with. And I had to use some new outlets here because I ran out of the ones I pulled out from the old shop. And so I made up a whole bunch of pigtails, went ahead and attached them to the outlets, and then got those attached to the faceplates, and then attached some Wago connectors to pigtail the outlets together. And then finally, I could install them on the boxes. And anytime you can batch out things like this, I think it makes the work go a lot faster than trying to do them one by one, like making up one faceplate, going to install it. It's just a lot of wasted energy and wasted digging around for tools. When I got to the last box here on the kind of work platform, I went ahead and passed the wire through into the CNC room so I could continue it on from there. And I went ahead and repeated the process of installing more 120 volt outlets in the CNC room off camera since with the CNC in the way, it's kind of hard to get footage in there. The last run of 120 volt outlets to do were on these two center posts into the dust collection closet and then along this kind of right wall of the shop. I got the conduit bent once again using my app to help come up with the measurements and then ran the conduit all the way to the very front wall of the shop and then up that wall so that I could plug my new garage door opener into that outlet. And yes, my new garage doors are in and they are amazing. But anyway, after running all of that conduit, I went ahead and made up the outlet boxes. And with that, I could call the electrical work done, at least for the time being. I still got to do some work in the spray booth, but this was a huge undertaking and I am really honestly pretty proud of myself that I was able to do all of this, all of the outlets work. I tested everything with my outlet testers and with my multimeter and everything checks out. So I think it turned out great. And it is so exciting to finally have some functional outlets throughout the shop. So we decided to start the install process here in kind of the center section of the shop. And mainly that was because there was the least amount of stuff in the way. And the first thing we had to do in this particular space was figure out how we were going to get this wall molding attached to these big links of steel I-beam that are running through the shop. And so I had thought of a few options, but I ended up landing on basically just sandwiching two by eights on either side of these steel beams, since we'd be needing to install the drop ceiling on both sides. And this ended up working really well. I set up a line laser about two inches above where the drop ceiling would end up being, and we used that to set the height of the two by eights. To attach the boards, we would just drill holes through these steel beams or use some of the existing holes, which were definitely very handy, and then just run a little over a three inch long GRK structural screw through to basically suck the two boards to each other, sandwiching the steel I-beam. And we also added some Lexel just for a little bit extra grab, and this really helped to kind of hold things in place while we were adding all of the clamps and getting the boards set in place. And this was definitely some awkward work and it was pretty slow going to start. Huh? Is that pretty easy? It's almost like I drill through the wood and then there's metal right behind yeah, it. Yeah, like, like half an inch of steel. steel. It's such hard work. <laughs> I hope you're still rolling. I am. 
Good. This is going to be a good little time lapse. I hope you're playing this real speed so people can see like one hole. This is one hole. Yeah. Oh. Through. Thank one you. minute, 20 seconds. Wow. I felt like that was pretty good too. All right, now this is the satisfying part. Now you can girk it. GRK, screw into the board on the other side. Oh. I could just keep driving it through, but that's probably yeah, no, good. Probably not. So the first thing to install for the drop ceiling was the wall molding. And we attached this to those two by eights with some inch and a quarter screws. And it was really simple to install since we could just line up the bottom edge of the wall molding with that laser line. Also, as I mentioned, we went ahead and pre-punched some holes in the wall molding pieces, which made getting the screws started easier. And when we needed to start a new piece of wall molding, we would either just butt it up to the last piece or overlap it by about an inch. And both of those seemed to work and look fine in the final installation. On the inside corners, we would cut and then just make a fold so it could continue wrapping around the corner and this seemed to look really nice. And thankfully in this first section, we didn't have any outside corners, but I will show that a little later. We did, however, have this super funky kind of curved wall and we were kind of scratching our heads as to how we would install the wall molding around it. But then we kind of came up with the idea to cut it, to basically kerf cut it like you would do for kerf bending wood. And we made a cut every six inches and that ended up being able to follow that curve very, very easily. And once that curved section was done, the wall molding was done, at least in this first section. So next we could start installing our main beams and this is also where we needed to decide on our layout. Once we had that figured out, we went ahead and set up a string line at our center mark, and we could reference off of that string line to set our lag screws. And again, these need to be added about every four feet, and they'll be screwed directly into the floor joists above. Check, we got some dust. Once the lag screws were installed, we could go ahead and start hanging the main beam. And this first main beam piece will need to be cut to length. And this will also dictate your layout, I guess, lengthwise. It depends on which way you're looking at your room. But once again, we ended up centering our grid across that distance. And so we just cut our main beam so that one of the slots for the cross tees would end up centered in the space. And then we could go ahead and get to work installing. To hang the main beam, use that hanger wire. And so we went ahead and pre-cut and bent some sections to hang from the lag screws. So it was already in location when we went to hang the main beam. We would set the laser line two inches below where we wanted the kind of final height of the ceiling. And once it was lined up with that two inch number, we could bend the hanger wire to match, run it through one of the holes in the main beam, and then twist it three or four times and it was set in place. We went ahead and added the hanger wire to the first section of main beam and then continued on with the next section, flipping it together with the previous section. Oh! And it was really just rinse and repeat down to the other end of the room from there. And we went ahead and did two rows of main beam and got those wrapped up. And then we could start installing some cross T's to double check that everything was looking right. Is this laser beam getting you right in the eyeballs like it is me? No, I'm too short. Oh. <laughs> there are some perks to being short. Oh, yeah. Laser beam right over my head. No worries. Hey, did you put some music in on that? Oh yeah. Okay. So the next row of main beam, which we had kind of been avoiding, landed on the curved section of the wall. And we actually used another line laser to help us figure out where that main beam needed to intersect. We're using this portable laser to shoot a line way down there to this curved wall so that we can mark our four foot increments because he can't like measure around the wall four feet from our tracks here, right? 51, so you need, uh, to your right, right. Too, too much. Come back. Quarter, quarter. Keep coming. It's like moving back somehow. Too far. Oh, right there. Now we can just put a screw in the wall there to pull our string line back. And we should be four feet off this other track. If we did our maths right. Oh! <laughs> Industrial athlete. Industrial athlete, my. So we got all of the rows of main beams installed here in the center section of the shop. And then we could start adding the cross tees around the border. And those obviously all needed to be cut to length. And these cross tees can be cut with aviation snips or tin snips. But since I have a metal chop saw, we decided to use that. And that definitely made really quick work of cutting these pieces to length. And it was also getting towards the end of day two at this point, And things were definitely starting to get a little silly. So overall, things were really starting to look good at this point, really starting to take shape, except for this one spot. 
<laughs> I mean, do we want to talk about the elephant in the room? Yeah. I mean, I mean, how, how did I miss I that? Seriously. Maybe he wants to put a light in there. <laughs> okay. So speaking of the lights, now that the grid was in in this intersection, we could also go ahead and start dropping in some of the LED troffer lights. Before dropping the troffers into the ceiling grid, I also went ahead and laid out the lights in SketchUp just so we could get these set in place for the time being. So with that, this center section was done for now, so we shuffled everything out of the way so that we could get started on the right section. So as it turned out, there was not enough clearance above my new garage doors, which again, I'm gonna cover in a future video, to have a drop ceiling above them. So we needed to figure out a way to stop the drop ceiling before it got to the garage. And we decided to keep it simple here and just used a two by 10 for the vertical section and attached that to a two by four, just to give us a little adjustability for attaching it to the floor joists above. And once the second section was installed, we could go ahead and start installing the wall molding in this area. And this was mostly just more of the same, although we did need to go ahead and cut away some of that inside corner trim from when we installed the plywood walls. And we ran this long on purpose so that we could get it nice and tight to the finished drop ceiling. And these tiles are super easy to cut. I used a drywall square and a utility knife. And the one thing to watch out for, especially with this particular type of ceiling tile, is they are a magnet for dirty fingerprints. So I made sure to wash my hands regularly while installing these things. The first couple tiles we installed with our work gloves on prior to knowing this, and I'm definitely gonna have to go back and replace those because they look pretty bad. We also went ahead and filled in that section of tiles above the pallet rack, which was pretty tricky with the pallet rack in the way, but Eric monkeyed around up there and we got it knocked out. And finally, we dropped in the troffer lights in this section to wrap up day three with the Perkins guys. We started on the left section of the shop on day four, and once again, we needed to add more boards to these walls, or at least we decided to because it made it easier since we were dealing with some concrete block walls in this area. We also spanned across the opening in the drywall above the panel to leave me kind of an access point if I wanna add more wiring in the future. We got the left section installed super quick, and then we could move into the CNC room, and we started in there by moving the CNC out of the way, and I am really glad I made the door opening there big enough for us to be able to do this, because it made the installation process really simple. This was a very small room. We only ended up having two rows of main beams in that room. So I wired these lights in three different sections, the left, right, and center sections of the shop, and I daisy chained the lights together in each section so that I could run them each off of one circuit. And with all that done, I could finally test the lights out. All right, time for the moment of truth. Yes, they're all on. I think they look great. Very even lighting. Oh, what a relief. That's super exciting. The only bummer is now I've got to do that whole thing again two more times to get the rest of the lights wired. With the lights wired up in this section, we could go ahead and fill in all of the tiles now. And thankfully my dad had some time to help me out. And big thanks to my dad for all this help. It was a lot of work cutting and fitting all of these border tiles. And some of them were pretty tricky, but he's a super detail oriented guy. And I think the ceiling is looking really good now that most of the tiles are in. Yeah, that looks great. How about that? While I continued doing more electrical work, my dad kept chugging along with the tiles and he went ahead and knocked out the CNC room as well as this section over my workbench. And it was really nice to slowly be working through these three giant pallets of drop ceiling tiles that have been here in the shop probably for close to a year at this point. The one I have now is a roll top door and the new one is kind of more along the lines of what you might be used to at your house. You know, it has tracks and one central spring. So the guys got started by removing the old door and this was definitely not a super simple process. There was a really powerful torsion spring inside of this door and I think that's what kind of makes garage door installation work not super DIY friendly. In my personal opinion, it's kind of best to leave this stuff up to the professionals. But they used a lift to get the door down because it was obviously super heavy. And as they removed it, they rolled it up using some ratchet straps. And I thought that was pretty clever. Finally, they removed the rest of the frame pieces and then they could get started installing the new door. The first step was to add some framing around this door opening and this is what the tracks will be mounted to. And they basically just added pressure treated boards on each side of the door opening with some concrete anchors. And then they also boxed out kind of the top of the opening building a sort of quasi header. And this just lowered the height of the door opening to match the size of the new door. Next, they added all the hardware to the door panels, the hinges and the rollers and the bottom weather seal. And none of this came installed from the factory, I think for shipping purposes. 
And then once that was done, they could set the first panel in place and get the tracks set in place based on the size of the panel. And this was one of the things that kind of struck me with this whole process is that they didn't do a whole lot of measuring. Everything was kind of based on the pieces they had. And by using the panels themselves for reference, they knew the tracks would end up exactly where they needed to be. They attached the tracks to the treated material with some lag screws and then set the next panel in place, making sure they were both level before moving on. They attached the first two panels together using those hinges and then just continued up the door, adding more panels, fastening the tracks in place on either side of the panels and attaching the hinges to the next panel in line. Before installing the last panel, they added the horizontal tracks, attaching them to the vertical tracks and the in bearing brackets, which will hold the shaft in place. Next, they assembled the springs onto the shaft and mounted that whole assembly to the wall. And all of that pressure treated material they added earlier made that installation process a lot easier so that they didn't have to use a whole bunch of concrete anchors. Once the shaft and springs were in place, they could attach the counterbalance lift cables to a bracket at the bottom of the door and the drums at the top of the door. And this mechanism allows this very heavy door to be lifted by hand in case of power failure and also helps to reduce the load on the motor. Next, they could tension the torsion springs and the specific number of turns was actually specified by Wayne Dalton based on the weight of this door, which I thought was pretty interesting. Finally, with all that done, they could get the last panel installed, thankfully, because it was a pretty cold day and there was a lot of very cold air being let in during this whole installation process. And once that panel was in, they could go ahead and partially open the door to set the location of the horizontal tracks. They attached the tracks to the joist using this perforated angle, and I quickly figured out there was not going to be nearly enough clearance above this garage door for a drop ceiling in this area, so the installer set this up so I could come back and add a layer of half-inch plywood and have these horizontal tracks still be level, which ended up working out great. Finally, with the horizontal tracks attached, we could test out the functionality of the door, and even without a motor, this thing was incredibly smooth, and you could raise and lower it with one finger. The last things to check off on day one were to install a sliding lock for security and also the jam seals on the outside of the building, which basically just provide an air seal between the door opening and the door itself. Back for day two, it was time to motorize the door and they used a jack shaft motor here, which is nice because this style of motor doesn't require additional clearance above the door so we can maximize the amount of headroom in this door opening. This particular motor had the option of an automatic deadbolt, which as the name implies, automatically locks the door when it's closed, which is super cool. And it also has a battery backup in case of a power outage. After those were installed, they installed the photo eye sensors for safety and then finally installed the remote. And then we could test the door out, which was a very exciting moment. Unfortunately, I didn't realize the rope they had attached to temporarily open and close the door would get in the way of the photo eyes, causing the door to go back up right before it finished closing. But the installer showed me where I went wrong and man, it was so nice to have a motorized garage door finally here in the shop. That is awesome. <laughs> So with the garage doors in, now it was time to tackle the ceiling above this garage door. Thankfully, the guys from the Perkins Builder Brothers were here working on the drop ceiling, and it is always a lot more fun when those guys are around. I've been sitting here watching Johnny and the guys work on this plywood ceiling because this garage door won't allow the drop ceiling over here. And I've been sick. That's why I'm just sitting here and I'm still a little sick. And I can tell Johnny just wants this done and he's not going to film it to the full <laughs> extent that he would normally so i had to step in and get up off my chair and film a little bit of this because it's interesting i think it should make it in the video so i stole johnny's phone and they're gonna keep working and cutting stuff piece of cake needs six foot arms <laughs> Why are you sweating so much? <laughs> <laughs> so this is interesting though. Right here we had a joist that has a knot and a big crack. And they put this two by four in, beat the bottom in to where it jacked that thing back up straight and put a big two by 10 scab, bunch of GRKs. We're using 3 8 CD, is that right? Because it was $20 instead of the, yeah, what was the other? 45. What what rating was it though? It was, a, BC it was a BC sanded. Half the price, and it really doesn't matter for the ceiling, I don't think. The garage door when it's open is gonna cover all this. 
You sure you need to go CrossFit today? I mean, this is looking like CrossFit-ish. Yeah, so they, so they will cancel my membership. Uh, <laughs> so this is smart. They're gonna take off, and they already did, this track where it mounts and go under it with the plywood. So you don't have to cut around it. it looks nice and clean. But I wasn't thinking about that when y'all started. I was like, oh, this is- it needs to be attached on that end, really. No. I don't think, I don't think did you mark the left and right? Yeah, where that, okay. Off the wall. Oh, okay. What kind of door is this? Jack Shaft. Jack Shaft. <laughs> that's a real name. Can't say that. So okay. <laughs> so we wrapped up the ceiling in this area by boxing in the area above the spring assembly. And we had to add some blocking here and install the plywood higher in this area for clearance. And then I went around and added some two by two trim around this entire perimeter to clean things up prior to painting. And one major benefit of installing this trim was it really helped to straighten out this pretty wavy plywood. Once the trim was in, I went ahead and caulked everything and I used a big stretch here. And this has become one of my favorite caulks for this type of thing, because I know there's gonna be a lot of movement in this building as I've seen in other areas and having a elastomeric, a very stretchy caulk will really help to prevent cracking down the line. Finally, it was time to get everything painted, including basically this entire half of the shop. And I went ahead and vacuumed the walls, covered all the outlets and got everything prepped and then sprayed on a coat of primer, which is where we're at right now. And then the last thing I've done since that garage door video was get a lot of the final painting work done. I painted these beams. I used that Rust-Oleum Rusty Metal Primer again, and I think it looks super cool. And then I also painted this curved wall to get that all one color with the rest of the shop. So all in all, my grand total out of pocket was just at $30,000, which is obviously a pretty significant expense, but the total for the materials I had provided to me was also about $30,000, $34,000 to be exact. So my out of pocket expense would have been $64,000 if I didn't make YouTube videos for a living, just to give you an idea of how much this would cost you. That being said, I think this was a great investment. I'm sure the property value with all the improvements I've made in this space would easily outweigh the cost that I sunk into this place. And I'm pretty sure I could turn around and sell this building for at least you know 20 or 30% more than what I bought it for, even after less than two years of owning this place. So hopefully that was helpful. If you guys have any more questions about any of the specifics of this build out, feel free to leave them in the comments below. If it's your first time here, go ahead and get subscribed and ring the notification bell so you don't miss my future videos. Also, I have links to all the tools, materials I talked about, as well as the playlist for this whole renovation series down in the video description. And last, if you wanna support me, I sell merch. I have plans available for a lot of my woodworking projects and I have both Patreon and YouTube members set up in case you guys wanna check that out. All right, thanks for watching y'all and until next time, happy building.